Well, good afternoon, brethren, and happy my Sabbath to you all. It's uh, great to be back up here at the end with you after my last opportunity to speak here a few months ago. Hey, my message today, we're going to look at one of the greatest leaders in the Bible who, with the help and power of God, led Israel out of Egypt. And today we're going to look at the life of Moses, who was the judge and prophet of the newborn nation of Israel. Now Moses was God's chosen instrument to help deliver the Israelites out of Egypt. Now he lived to a ripe old age of 120 years old. And his life will be broken up into three stages which we'll look at and draw some practical lessons from. Now the first stage of Moses' life was his early years as an adopted prince of Egypt. After he was spared from the decree for all the Israelite marbles to be killed. Now the second stage of Moses' life began at age 40, according to Stephen in Acts chapter 7. After he fled to the land of Midian following an incident where he struck an Egyptian dead for mistreating an Israelite. And he would be there for 40 years. Now the third and last stage of his life began with God calling him to go back to Egypt and to deliver Israel with God's help. Now after Pharaoh refused to release the Israelites, God brought Ten great plagues on Egypt, leading to Pharaoh relenting and Israel's exodus from Egypt. Now, after that would come the dramatic Red Sea crossing, the giving of the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, and the forty years of wandering that God decreed because of Israel's sin. Now, since Moses died at age 120, some forty years after the exodus, this means that Moses was 80 years old when he led them out of Egypt. Now it's interesting that each stage of his life is 40 years long, which is a biblically significant number related to trial and to testing. Now today in part one of Lessons from Moses, we're going to look at the historical background of the Exodus and the events in the book of Exodus just prior to the birth of Moses. Now I plan to cover the life of Moses in parts two and three, of lessons from Moses and the Exodus. Now I've given you a handout covering the correct archaeological place and time for the Exodus. Now when I do uh, part two, I'll have another on Moses with key data, the lessons from his life, as well as maps and other data. Now most people's perception of Moses has in large part been based on the way that Moses is portrayed by Pontold Heston and Cecil B. The Mill's all-time classic movie, The Ten Commandments. Now there are a number of myths and misunderstandings about the Exodus and the life of Moses, some of which come from that classic movie, as well as other places. So as we carefully analyse Moses and the Exodus from the Bible, we're going to dispel a number of myths and misunderstandings along the way. Now in his book, The Authority of the Bible, Colin Peckham describes how many of the events in the Old Testament were types and shadows of events in the New Testament. Now in relation to the Exodus and Conquest, he writes, The history of Israelites pictures the New Testament plan of salvation, showing that the Old Testament and the New Testament present one message. In the Old Testament, it is the shadows and types and in the New Testament, we have the reality of an accomplished salvation. The Israelites were admonished to the Egyptians. Egypt is a picture of the old life of sin in which we are all held under the domination of Pharaoh, who represents the devil. And they were to be spared from the judgment of God, which rested on the whole land, only by applying the blood to their doorposts. The slain lamb is the substitute for the firstborn. And God's land is our substitute. Now their eventful journey from Egypt had one objective, to bring them to Canaan. As many able commentators have affirmed, the picture of Canaan is that of the life of Christian victory in the Bible. Now before I cover the story of Moses, straight off the bat I want to cover some important historical background about the Exodus as many scholars have rejected the Bible's claim that the 
Exodus is a real historical event. Now when it comes to matching what the Bible says happened and what archaeology has found, there is usually excellent agreement between the Bible and archaeology back to about 750 BC at the time of the dominance of the Assyrian Empire. But before then, while some general things match, there seems to be these great mismatches between the Bible and archaeology. Not only is there no evidence of certain Bible events according to archaeologists, but the evidence seems to say the opposite of what the Bible says. For example, using the standard chronology of Egypt, there is no evidence for the mighty empire of King Solomon in the early Iron Age, as well as a complete mismatch between the biblical account of the Exodus and the Conquest and the archaeology of the late Bronze Age, where the standard chronology places both the early and late dates proposed by scholars for Exodus. Now, following Kathleen Kenyon's excavations at Jericho, when she was unable to find any late Bronze Age city at Jericho to conquer a massive wave of scepticism about the historical accuracy of the Bible swept through Western academia. And these apparent mismatches have been seized upon by critics of the Bible to greatly discredit the Bible. When Jesus said that we have to love God with our heart, mind and soul, the use of the word mind here implies that our faith in God and his word is not to be a blind faith where we believe without evidence, or worse, believe when the evidence contradicts what we have faith in. Now given the excellent agreement between the Bible and archaeology back to around 750 BC, why then do we find such great mismatches between the Bible and the archaeology before that time? Now this problem strikes at the very historical authenticity of the Bible. Can the Bible be relied upon or not? What changes before 750 BC where we go from excellent agreement to poor agreement between the Bible and archaeology? Now, is the Bible, is the problem with the Bible crossing from history back to made-up mythology, as essentially proposed by archaeologist Israel Finkelstein? Or is the problem with the interpretations of archaeology and the chronology that's being used to date the evidence that archaeology has discovered? So if we were to accept the standard chronology of Egypt, there is a vexing problem that it presents for Bible scholars. Now according to the standard chronology of Egypt, the place in archaeological history where we would expect to find evidence supporting the evidence, one of the greatest events in the Bible, is showing no evidence whatsoever that such an event took place. Now there are two dates that are normally put forward by biblical scholars for the Exodus. Now we read in Exodus 6 verse 1 that the Exodus occurred 480 years before Solomon's temple was built, which gives us a biblical date of around 1450 BC. Now this date falls in the middle of the 18th dynasty of Egypt, according to Egyptologists. Now in Exodus 1 verse 11, it says that the Israelites built these store cities of Python and Ramesses. Now the city of Pi Ramesses in the Delta is usually associated with this city of Ramesses. Now since this city was built during the reign of Ramesses the Great, many Bible scholars place the Exodus at a later date of around 1250 BC during the 19th dynasty, when Ramesses the Great reigned according to the standard chronology. Now according to Egyptology, both of these dates fall in the middle of the period that they call the Late Bronze Age. Now this term, the Late Bronze Age, is a term that archaeologists use for the period of time that is contemporary with Egypt's two mightiest dynasties, Dynasty 18 and Dynasty 19. 
Now these are the two dynasties of Egypt, two most well-known pharaohs, King Tutankhamun and Ramses the Great, were all Egypt. Now before those two dynasties was the time period that archaeologists call the Middle Bronze Age. And after those two dynasties is the next period of time that they refer to as the Iron Age. So please bear into your mind that the usual place that archaeologists place the Exodus is the Late Bronze Age. As we've seen, the Late Bronze Age is the time of Egypt's two mighty dynasties, Dynasty 18 and Dynasty 19. Now let's go through the list of problems trying to place the Exodus during either the 18th or the 19th dynasty. Now the biggest problem in Egypt is that during the 18th dynasty, we have no great catastrophe recorded in Egypt matching the plagues of Egypt. In fact, we actually have the complete opposite. There was great prosperity and the Egyptian kingdom expanded to its greatest size. Now the 1450 BC date for the Exodus falls during the reign of a pharaoh called Tutmos III who conquered all the way up to the river Euphrates. Now many Christian scholars placed the Exodus during the reign of his successor, Amenhotep II, but again we find no great catastrophe and great prosperity and expansion during his reign and the other 18th dynasty kings that followed him. Now we have exactly the same problem with the time of Ramses the Great in the 19th dynasty, with no great catastrophe, and he too expanded Egypt's empire into Canaan and Syria. So during both of these dynasties, which are two of the best documented dynasties, Egypt was at her peak. She was very prosperous, and she expanded all the way to Canaan and Syria. Now this is completely different to the state of Egypt at the time of the Exodus, when Egypt, according to the Bible, suffered a gigantic catastrophe. Now we also have documented evidence from Egypt pointing to Israel already being a nation in the land of Canaan during these two dynasties. Now the Berlin pedestal, based on its writing style, has been noted to around the middle of the 18th dynasty. Now we've got three name rings of peoples who have conquered Ashkelon, Canaan, and Israel. Now this evidence shows that Israel was already formed as a nation in the land when this was carved. Now in order for Tatmas III, or his successor, Amhotep II, to be the pharaoh of the Exodus, this inscription would have to be carved at least 50 years before their reign. Now the evidence of this Merlin pedestal on its own appears to rule out a 19th dynasty Exodus. Now another skiller compounds the problem even further for the 19th dynasty. Now, Francis the Great successor was known as Menetta. Sorry, Menetta. <laughs> now there's a skiller called the Menetta, or Israel skiller, from the time of this pharaoh, and it reads, Israel is desolate. His seed is no more. Again, this argues for an Israelite presence in Canaan as a fully formed nation earlier than the time of Francis the Great. Now, another problem that we have is that we have all the mummies of the pharaohs from the 18th and the 19th dynasties, including our three main kingdoms shown here, proposed as the pharaoh of the Exodus. Yet the Bible is clear that the Pharaoh of the Exodus drowned in the Red Sea. Now Exodus 14 28 says all the army that went in, not one survived. And that's repeated in Psalm 6. Now Exodus 15 19 says that the horse of Pharaoh went in, according to the King James Version. And we've got an even more clear verse in Psalm 36 at the bottom here which says that God overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. Now these verses put together leave little room for the view that any Egyptian, 
Not even the ferry itself survived the Red Sea crossing, despite the fact that Neil Brunner had back to Egypt in the ten months. Now, the only reason we see Neil Brunner make it back to Egypt in the ten months is because Cecil B. And Mill knew that we had the mummy of Francis the Great. Now, supporting those Bible verses, Josephus, in his account of the parting of the Red Sea, wrote the following. And thus did all these men perish, so that there was not left one man as a messenger of his clony to the rest of the Egyptians. Now he was certainly of the opinion that the Pharaoh did not survive. Now that's what the consensus is amongst the secular historians of the school regarding the historical accuracy of the conquest of Palestine by the Israelites. I quote. The prevailing scholarly view is that the book of Joshua is not a factual account of historical events. The apparent setting of Joshua is the 13th century BCE, a time of widespread city disruption. But, with a few exceptions, that's all of the the destroyed cities are not the ones the Bible associates with Joshua. And the ones that it does associate with him show little or no sign of even being occupied at the time. According to archaeologist Andy Kilman, most scholars today accept that the majority of the conquest narratives in the book of Joshua are devoid of historical reality. End quote. So we see the situation in Palestine is just as bad as the try and pace the conquest during the time of either the 18th or the 19th dynasties. There is no widespread destruction throughout the land of Canaan during the 18th dynasty, despite threats from bandits known as the Arpuru, who also threatened areas way north of where the Israelites conquered the land. Now, there were, however, a number of cities that were destroyed in Palestine near the end of the 19th dynasty, according to archaeologists. Now, the destroyed cities, however, as noted before, are not the ones the Bible associates with Joshua's conquest. In fact, according to the archaeology, most of the cities Joshua conquered were not even inhabited during the late Bronze Age, including its most famous city, Jericho. Now, in an article that appeared in the SIS Review called A Chart to Illustrate the Conquest of Canaan, by John Vinson, he created this chart here to compare the archaeological finds for both the Late Bronze and the Middle Bronze Age at the major cities mentioned in the Compass by Joshua. Now notice the lack of matches with Joshua's con conquest as described in the Bible in the left-hand column placing the conquest during the Late Bronze Age. And also now notice on the other hand the number of matches that we get with the earlier period known as the Middle Bronze Age in the right hand column. So, in a nutshell, the two big problems that archaeologists have with believing the Bible's account of the Exodus using either of the two dates put forward during the 18th or 19th dynasties are one, both of the 18th and 19th dynasties are very well documented, and there's not a single hint of any great catastrophe impacting Egypt at the time. And two, most of the cities that the Bible tells us were conquered by the Israelites were not occupied during the late Bronze Age, such as Jericho. Now there are four different approaches to this problem of trying to match the archaeological record with the biblical account of the Exodus and conquest. Now, the first is the view of most secular archaeologists, such as Israel Finkelstein and William Deva. And they believe that because of the great inconsistencies between the late Bronze Age archaeology and the biblical account, that the stories of the Exodus and the Conquest can be written off as having no historical basis whatsoever. Now, the second approach is the view that the standard chronology is correct and the Bible is only partly true and partly false. Now this is the view of liberal Bible scholars and archaeologists such as William Albright and 
can eat. Now the dominant view amongst these is that the Exodus took place during the 19th dynasty around 1250 BC because the archaeology shows that there was some semblance of widespread destruction in Canaan, unlike the earlier 18th dynasty. But however, this later date that he used conflicts with much of the chronological data in the Bible and shortens the time for the time of the judges to half of what the Bible says. Now the third approach to the problem is that the standard chronology of Egypt is correct and the Bible is also true. Now this is the approach taken by the associates of biblical research, such as archaeologist Brian Wood and Scott Schubert. Now as we've seen, this approach has some very serious challenges to overcome. Now they do try and redate the pottery in, in, Canaan, in, in Canaan to try and reconcile this problem. But redating the pottery only solves the problems at the Palestine end and it doesn't deal with the other problems that we find in Egypt. Now unless we're missing some key pieces of the puzzle, there seems to be too much of a mismatch to claim that both the Bible and the standard chronology are without fault. Now if that is true, there's something that has to give. Either the Bible is at fault or the standard chronology of Egypt is at fault. Now the final approach to the Exodus problem is that the Bible is true and that it is the standard chronology which is faulty. Now this is the view of chronological revisions such as Emmanuel Malkowski, David Roll, John Vincent amongst others. So we saw before how there was an excellent match between Joshua's conquest and the cities destroyed in Canaan during the Middle Bronze Age. Now can we find evidence in Egypt that also points towards the Middle Bronze Age being a better match for the Exodus? Now it just happens that underneath that 19th dynasty city of Hieronymus, archaeologist Manfred Bittak uncovered an old city which Bittak was able to identify as the ancient city of Avaris in the eastern Gaza where the Israelites were. Now the archaeology of Avaris spans two periods of time. Now the older level showed it was dated to the time of the Middle Kingdom. Now apart from a royal precinct, the site was predominantly settled by Semites from Asia. Now the Semites of the early period were prosperous to begin with, but it seems apparent from the archaeology that towards the latter part of their time there, that they became impoverished, just as we see with the Israelites in Egypt. Now after this, these Semitics left the site was then occupied by the Hyksos, who were foreign invaders who came in from East. Now, Varus was populated by about 30,000 people. <coughs> now, John Benson notes that there's evidence of many more of these Asiatic sites nearby, at least 20 or 30 of them, which haven't been excavated to any great scale so far. So, it seems quite unlikely that when the Bible in Exodus 1 11 speaks of Ramesses, that's one of the cities built by the Israelites that a later editor of the Old Testament, such as Ezra, for example, updated the older name from Avaris to the newer name of Ramses that was more familiar to the readers of his day. I'll give you an example of one such, another such example. In Genesis 14, we read about Abraham pursuing the five kings up to Dan, long before the tribe of Dan had a popular city and gave it that name. Now there is much evidence arguing that the dating of when Egypt's pharaohs ruled has been greatly overextended, and that many of the dynasties reign later than the standard BC dates that are assigned to them. Now David Roll, who is a trained archaeologist and is ironically an agnostic, has argued that Egypt's timeline has been overextended by a few hundred years. Now he dates the Exodus not during the late Bronze Age but during the Middle Bronze Age. And he places it at the time of the catastrophe that occurred during the 13 at the end of Egypt's Middle Kingdom. Now he's 
station in Tima High's excellent documentary, which I very highly recommend, called Patterns of Evidence Exodus. Now, in that documentary, David Ross says the following You look for a class in Egypt, the Egypt civilization, and that is where you'll find Moses and the Exodus. Now, with that in mind, here is the uh, document called the Airport Papyrus, which currently is housed in a museum in Leiden in Holland. Now, John Wilson, in his book, The Admissions of Ibor, based on its language and orthography, dates this document to the 13th dynasty during the Middle Kingdom in the Bronze Age. <coughs> now, those who look at this document, some claim that this is a record of the Egyptians of the Ten Plagues of Egypt which it bears the most eerie resemblance to. Now, some of its passages read as follows. Plague stalks through the land, blood is everywhere. Nay, but the river is blood. Trees are destroyed, no fruit or herbs are found. Dates, columns are consumed by fire. The land is not light. He who places his brother on the ground is everywhere. People are stripped of clothes. Their slaves taste what you can find. Gold, silver, lapis lazuli, and turquoise are strung on the neck of female slaves. The stranger people from without are come into Egypt. Now, when I was in Holland, I went to see it with my late friend Gary Mitchelson. Now, there was a Dutch translation to the side of it, so I, I took a photo of the translation in Dutch. And without telling her where it came from, I later asked Gary's girlfriend at the time, Marion, to translate it for me from Dutch to English and tell me what she thought it was. And I said, I was very gratified when she said it sounds just like the place of Egypt. Now, one critic of this document, being a true historical record, stated that it was fictional because it was contradictory. Giving an example that in one place it says, the whole land is a great want, while at the same time, Female slaves become rich. Now, ironically, this specific detail is one of the best proofs linking with the time of the Exodus, as the Bible tells us that just before the last plague, the Israelites took their spoil from the Egyptians before leaving Egypt. The Egyptian priest Nitha recorded that in the reign of a 13th dynasty king that God smote the Egyptians and foreigners called the Hyksos took over Egypt for a long time who invaded the country without difficulty or even a battle. Now if the Exodus was a real historical event, it would be no surprise that a foreign power would seek to conquer Egypt and take advantage of the destruction caused by the Ten Plagues and the fact that Pharaoh and his entire army were all drowned in the Red Sea. Now, as we saw before, if we compare the archaeology of the Middle Bronze Age with the biblical account of the conquest, we get a perfect match. Now, all the sites Joshua conquered had destruction lines during the latter part of the Middle Bronze Age. Now, while Kathleen Kennedy did not find evidence for a late Bronze Age city of Jericho, she certainly found it near the end of the Middle Bronze Age. And right across the city, they found full storage jars in the Middle Bronze Age destruction layer. This tells us three things. Firstly, it indicates a quick attack, not a long siege, which is unusual given the stubble walls that it had. Second, it was near harvest time, and the Bible places it that the time of the barley harvest when the Passover is kept. Now, analysis of the ground showed it was actually barley. And thirdly, it was not spoiled by its attackers, which again agrees with the biblical account in Joshua 6. Now, there is much evidence for a collapse of civilization in Egypt at the time of the Middle Kingdom. Those Semitic people prior to them dwelt in the Nile Delta as Evers at Avaris. Who were rich to begin with, then became impoverished before they departed Egypt after a great catastrophe. Now, soon after that, during the Middle Bronze Age, there is destruction right across Palestine of a great many walled cities, including virtually all ones noted in the Book of Joshua. 
So by placing the excess at the end of the mill here, near the end of the mill bronze age, the correct time is restored for the conquest of the land of Canaan as demanded by archaeology, which records the destruction of cities all across Palestine at that time. Now this excellent match during the Middle Bronze Age in both Egypt and Canaan shows that the Exodus really indeed was a true and real historical event. So in, in summary, trying to reconcile the Exodus and the Conquest with the archaeology of the Late Bronze Age could be likened to trying to place a square peg into a round hole. The round hole is a scriptural account of the Exodus account. And the square peg is the archaeology in Egypt and Israel for the late Bronze Age. As we have seen, we do, however, have a round peg that will fit perfectly into the round hole, and that is the archaeology in Egypt and Israel for the mid Bronze Age. Now, how long was Egypt, sorry, Israel, in slavery in Egypt for? Now, there has been a rather persistent myth that has continued to be perpetuated that the slavery of the Israelites lasted some 400 years. Now, this is a misunderstanding of Exodus 12, verse 40, that says that the sojourning of Israel was 430 years. Now, notice carefully the word is sojourn, not the word slavery. Now the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3, verses 16 to 17, says that from Abraham and the promises were made to Mount Sinai and giving the law was that same period of time, 430 years. Now Josephus further clarifies this 430 years when he wrote, I left Egypt in the month of Antiochus on the 15th day of the lunar month, 430 years after our forefather Abraham came to Canaan, but 215 years only after Jacob had removed into the Egypt of the Now that figure of 215 years from Abraham moving to Canaan to Jacob moving to Egypt is correct as it is a composite of three numbers. Now the first is 25 years, which is the difference between um, Abraham moving to Canaan as age 75 so Isaac was born when Abraham was 100. Now next we add how old Isaac was when Jacob was born, which was 60 years. And then we add Jacob's age of 130 years when he moved to Egypt. Now from that second block of 10, 15 years, we have to subtract the remaining 71 years of Joseph's life after his father moved to Egypt as the slavery did not begin until after Joseph died at age 110. Now we know that Moses was 80 years old at the time of the Exodus and he was born into slavery. So that means the slavery was somewhere between 80 years minimum and 144 years maximum. So based on that, the slavery of Israel was probably only around about 100 years old. Now the book of Exodus opens up with the names of the sons of Jacob, and then verse 5 says, All those who were descendants of Jacob were the 70 persons, but Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, all his brothers, and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. So we see in Exodus at the beginning of the fulfilment of God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 15 that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the seashore, which is emphasized in Exodus 1 7. By the use of five different descriptions they are fruitful, increased abundantly, multiplied, waxed exceedingly, and the land was filled with them. Now, it seems that God was very much behind this population explosion of the children of Israel to fulfill his promise to Abraham. <laughs> now we're told in Exodus 12 37 that the number of Israelites who left Egypt were 600,000 men, approximately. Now, when the first census was taken a year later in Numbers 1, we're told in verse 46 
that the number of men 20 years and over who can go to war was 603,550. Now, based on that number of men, if we added women and children, we're probably looking at a number of around two to three million Israelites. That is a mind-blowing number of people to grow to in a little over 200 years since Jacob moved to Egypt. Now, the city of Brisbane has a population of two million people, so the Exodus, according to the biblical account, would be the equivalent of moving the entire population of Brisbane. Now, is that really possible? Was the number of Israelites exaggerated by Moses, as many people claim, or is it wrongly interpreted due to a false understanding of the original language? Now, numbers one during the first census, a year after they left Egypt, all the numbers from each tribe are listed along with the grand total, which we saw before was 603, 550 men. Now, in order to scale that what seems an impossibly large number, many scholars interpret the Hebrew word for 1,000, the word LF, to mean a clan. Now, those who interpret LF this way say there are only about 20,000 Israelites. Now, is it true that the word, it is true that the word LF can mean both 1,000 and also chief or clan? So is clan or unit the correct interpretation? Let's look at the titles for the clans and the number of people at the first census if we translate the left as clan compared to its normal meaning of a thousand. And when you add up the tribe numbers using uh, clans for the left, you get 598, not 603 LFs, as stated in numbers 146. On the other hand, when you add up the number of uh, the tribe numbers using a thousand for a left, they are perfectly to 603 to 550 as stated at the end of the census. Now, some critics might say that the grand total for the census was a later addition to the text that incorrectly used the wrong translation. Now, according to Exodus 30, verse 13, when a census or poll was done, all the men were, were to give half a shekel to the, ten, to the sanctuary. Now in Exodus 38, when such a poll tax was taken up, the amount of silver collected was a hundred talents plus another 1775 shekels. Now there are actually 3,000 shekels to a talent, so a hundred talents is the equivalent of 300,000 shekels. Now throw in that extra 1775 shekels, and you get a grand total of 301,775 shekels. If we want to find out the number of half shekels on that, we simply double it, and we come up with that number of 603,550, which is the exact match for the number of men in the first census. And when we do that same comparison between a left and a thousand in the second census, we have exactly the same um, result. Now, according to the book of Exodus, Israel grew from 75 to over 2 million people if we factor in women and children in a mere 2 to 15 years. Now, is that even mathematically possible? Well, let's try and figure out approximately how many children each couple would have to have, on average, for Israel's population to grow to that number in only 215 years. In Genesis 46, we're given the numbers of those who went down to Egypt. Now, Jacob, of course, had 12 sons. Now, those 12 sons had another 53 sons between them. So that's an average of 4.5 sons. And if we had the same number of daughters, we would get about nine kids per couple. So just bear that in mind as we move on to the next slide. Now, in order to figure out just how many children each couple would need to have to reach population between 2 and 3 million at that time, I've created a spreadsheet to calculate that number. So I started with a total of 75 inclusive of Joseph's family, and I've used nine generations of around 25 years each. Now once we calculate the number of new kids and add that to the existing population, I then subtract the number of deaths. And for that figure, I approximate the total population three generations earlier. <coughs> 
So let's start with four case per couple. Now the number of case per couple gives us, that number of case per four per couple gives us 32,000 after nine generations. Now five case per couple takes the final total up to 213,000. Now it's just over a million with six kids per couple. Then almost four million with a seven kids per couple. And if we put it 6.5, we have a final total of about two million. So you see that sort of amazing growth. It's actually quite feasible under the right conditions if the user wants to average between six and a half and seven kids per couple. Now, following the death of Moses, we read in Exodus 1, starting in verse 8. Now, there was a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply and happen in the event of war, that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh, supply cities, Python, and Ramses. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. They made their lives bitter with hard bondage. So we see here the Egyptians are afraid of the Israelites, especially if they join their enemies and uh, fight against them, so they decide to slay them. Now, Jacob and his family migrated to Egypt. They dwelt in the land of Goshen in the eastern Nile Delta. Now, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, called the Septuagint, the word Goshen in Genesis 45 10 is called the Egyptian term Gesem. And this word Gesem specifically referred to an area around a long, narrow, formal lake that branched off the Nile in a place that is today called Wadi Chumat where there are quite a number of Semitic place names. <laughs> now, Donovan Paul, author of the Exodus Problem and its Ramifications, presents several lines of evidence <coughs> arguing that there was a significant overlap between Dynasties 12 and 13 of Egypt's Middle Kingdom. Now, one Egyptian king list called the Sophos list, we have a number of Dynasty 12 kings, and then only two Dynasty 13 kings before it then gives the names of the Hyksos kings who came after. Now this leads Paul to argue that Dynasty 13 was actually a secondary line of kings underneath Dynasty 12 before that dynasty ends and those last two Dynasty 13 kings reigned before the Exodus. Now this leads him to believe that Dynasty 12's second pharaoh, Sesostris the first, happy looking chap that we see here at the bottom left was the Pharaoh of Joseph. Now he was followed by two more kings before Sesostris III reigned following the death of Moses. Now Sesostris believes that Sesostris reigned. Paul believes that Sesostris III was the Pharaoh who enslaved the Israelites and that his successor, Amenahab III, was the Pharaoh who ordered the killing of the male maids. Now here are statues of those two pharaohs that were responsible for the enslavement of the Israelites according to Don and Paul. Now to me they look rather grumpy and mean looking pharaohs, not unlike internet sensation grumpy cat. Now several of the Middle Kingdom pyramids were built near the great lake called the Fayum, and in the midst of those pyramids was a town called Cahoon which was a war facility where evidence was found that held many, many slaves. Now the inhabitants of Cahoon were likely the labour force that were used to build some of the nearby Middle Kingdom pyramids. Now unlike the stone pyramids of the Old Kingdom, these were built with mud bricks placed with straw, the very same material the Israelites were using for building for the Egyptians as noted in Exodus 5. Now, just think this nice. One of the things that the Egyptians had the Israelites built were pyramids. So, that likely was these Middle Kingdom pyramids. Now, at some point after the Egyptians are a slave, comes a shocking decree which 
was likely in the reign of an Amenemhat III. We see that the Pharaoh orders all his people who have slaves working for them to kill every male baby. Horrible. Now the Hebrew midwives probably do all they can to save any male babies they, and uh, try and help them for which God commands them for. Now notice one of the names of these uh, midwives. Her name is Shifra. Go back to that a now, one notable discovery of Mephrobita's team at Avaris was that they found amongst the early semi population an extremely high mortality rate of newborns. Now, according to the report, when all the children's graves aged 10 years and younger were identified, it was found that only 50% died in the first three months of life. And when the graves of those who made it to adulthood were examined, it was seen that there were there were 60% females to 40% males. So the reduction appears to have been in the male side of the population. So could this massive increase in infant burials of the virus be evidence for the killing of the male Israelite children? Now, the virus was not the only place where evidence of such high infant mortality occurred. Now, such evidence is also found at Cahoon, the town that we looked at, before near the Middle Kingdom periods. Now, archaeologist Rosalie David wrote the following about this town of Cahoon. She writes, It is apparent that the Asiatics were present in the town in some numbers, and this may have reflected the situation elsewhere in Egypt. The exact homeland in Syria or Palestine cannot be determined. The reason for their presence remains unclear. Now, Petrie discovered wooden boxes underneath the floors of many of the houses at Cahoon. They contain babies, sometimes buried two or three to a box, and aged only a few months at death. That's just consistent, of course, with the Pharaoh's decree. And she goes on to say that the quantity, range, and type of articles of everyday use which were left behind in the houses may indeed suggest that the departure was sudden and unpremeditated. Now, the evidence of this sudden departure of slaves from a walled town of slaves begs the question how can slaves all suddenly get up and walk out of Egypt? Now, another piece of evidence that lends support to Israel's former presence in the nation of Egypt at this time is the Brooklyn Papyrus. Now, the Brooklyn Papyrus records a slave list with names that seem to come straight off the pages of the Bible, such as Asher, Issachar, Manahem, and Shifra, the one that we looked at before. Now, also a note in this is that there was also a disproportionately high number of females in this slave list. Now, before I used the title of my generations to calculate the number of Israelites at the time of the Exodus, Yet in Genesis 15, 16, God told Abraham that they would come out in the fourth generation. Now, a generation in this verse could refer to three score and ten years, a typical lifetime, or it could possibly refer to the special case of the family of Moses and Aaron, where due to the lateness of having children, there are only four generations. Now, that covers the historical background and the events leading up to the birth of Moses. So on that note, we'll conclude part one, and I'll begin to cover the life of Moses proper in the next part of Lessons from Moses and of the Exodus. Well, good afternoon and happy Sabbath to you all. So good to be back up here again with you all. Now, uh, way back on the last day of the break, I gave part one of Lessons from Moses. And now that I've finished off my series on the patriarchs, it's time now to return to Lessons from Moses and to continue with part two. Now in part one, we covered the background to the Exodus. We looked at the issues with dating that caused many historians to doubt the story of the Exodus and the changes to Egypt's timeline that, when applied, allows us to find stunning historical and archaeological evidence for Israel's time in Egypt. And, um, 
the plagues that God brought onto them, as well as the amazing correlation of destroyed cities in Palestine that match the conquest under Joshua. Now, we also looked at events in the book of Exodus that preceded the birth of Moses, and uh, now today in part two, we're going to get into the life of Moses proper. Now, today we'll go through the story of his birth, his early years, his flight to Midian as an exile from Egypt, and we'll finish off with his return to Egypt after God charges him with the responsibility of leading his people out of slavery. And we'll then conclude by looking at the question of just who the Pharaoh of the Exodus was. Now it looks like I'm probably going to have five parts in this whole series on Moses and Exodus. I think next time I'll probably end up going from um, the place of Egypt through to the Red Sea Crossing. And part four will be from the Red Sea Crossing to Mount Sinai and the time of Mount Sinai. And then in part five we'll take the story from Mount Sinai up to the Promised Land. Now Moses was God's chosen instrument to help deliver the Israelites out of Egypt. Now he lived to the right old age of 120 years old, and his life can be broken up into three stages. Now first, we have his early years as an adopted prince of Egypt, after he was spared from the decree for all the Israelite male babies to be killed. Now the second stage of his life began at age 40, according to Stephen in Acts 7, after he fled to the land of Midian, following an incident where he struck an Egyptian dead for mistreating an Israelite. He would be there for 40 years. Now, the third stage of his life began with God calling him to go back to Egypt and to deliver Israel. Now in Exodus 7 and verse 7 states that Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to now, after Pharaoh refused to release the Israelites, God then brought ten great plagues upon Egypt, leading to Pharaoh relenting and Israel's exodus from Egypt. Now, after that would come the dramatic Red Sea crossing, the giving of the Ten Commandments in Mount Sinai, and then the forty years of wandering that God decreed because of Israel's sin. Now, Moses died at age 120, some 40 years after the Exodus. And this confirms what Exodus 7, 7 says that Moses was 80 years old when he led them out of Egypt. Now in Exodus 2, we read about the birth of Moses. Now his parents came from the tribe of Levi. Now the patriarch of the tribe of Levi, if you recall from the story of Jacob, was a violent man who, with his brother Simeon, killed many of the men of Shechem as retaliation for the seduction of their sister, Dinah. Now, when it came to passing on who would be the next patriarch of the family of Jacob, Jacob passed over his three older sons, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, due to various indiscretions, and gave his blessing to Judah to then the family. Now, Levi, though, would now be honoured by being the tribe from which the deliverer of Israel, Moses, would be born from, and later would be the tribe which the priesthood would come from. Now, Amram married his father's sister, Yochebed, or his aunt, who presumably was close in age to himself than his father. Now, this, of course, is before the statutes which would prohibit marriage to such close relations which were given at Mount Sinai. Now, Yochebed is mistakenly referred to as Yochebel in the Ten Commandments movie, one of a few historical inaccuracies in that movie. Now, Josephus states that Amram was very concerned about Israel and the want of young men due to Pharaoh's decree when he prayed to God. And he had a vision where he was told that their child would be concealed and then brought up in a surprising way and would later deliver the Hebrew nation from bondage. Now Hebrews 11 verse 23 it says, By faith Moses when he was born was hidden three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. Now mother's, Moses' mother, Yochebed, hides Moses for three months. Now her and Amram were not afraid of the king. 
this come up. Now, if Josephus's account of the vision that Amram had was true, then this would help to explain the confidence and faith that they had that their male child would live. Now, we know from Exodus 7 and 7 that I quoted before that Aaron was three years older. It is only Moses who was threatened by the king's decree. Now, the decree specifically was stated as every male child that is born, so only new babies. So the decree was likely only issued after Aaron became an infant and is no longer a new baby. Now Moses' other sibling is his older sister Miriam, who is likely to be around five to ten years old as she is old enough to follow Moses down the river. Now when Moses, when Jochebed couldn't hide him anymore, she made an ark of bulrushes and then put him into the river. Oops, wrong baby. Now here's a little bit of trivia for you. The character of Superman was actually created by a couple of Jewish boys, so it's not surprising that they would draw on this imagery from the Old Testament. Now Moses being saved physically as a baby would later become a type of Jesus being spared as a baby when Joseph and Mary were told to flee to Egypt. Now in Exodus 2, we then read that the daughter of Pharaoh came to bathe along the Nile River and she found the ark or basket with the baby Moses in. Now she was in no doubt where this baby had come from. She said that it was one of the Hebrews' children. Now she then names the baby Moses, which is an Egyptian name meaning drawn from. Now Moses is the Anglicite or English version of the Hebrew name Moshe. Now we actually see this name as part of the name of some of the pharaohs. For example, Ramses or Ramoses means drawn from Ram, and Tutmoses means drawn from Toph. Now David Down, he speculates that Moses may have actually be a shortened form of a longer name that the pharaohs duly gave to him, such as Harpy Moses, meaning drawn from the Nile god Harpy. That's his speculation. Now Moses' sister was following the ark as it drifted downstream and when she saw Pharaoh's daughter having compassion on him as Moses is crying, she boldly appears and asks Pharaoh's daughter if she would like a Hebrew woman to nurse him. Now Pharaoh's daughter agrees to this, so Jacob had got to spend a little bit more time with Moses before Pharaoh's daughter adopts him as, one, as her own son. Now this is actually a very brave move on the part of Pharaoh's daughter, given she knew that the child was Hebrew, and she knew of the Pharaoh's decree about killing the male babies. She may well have hidden uh, his Hebrew ancestry from the Pharaoh, and claimed that the gods had magically given her a son. Now Josephus states that she was without child, though that's not specifically stated in the Bible. Now in Josephus' account, he gives the name of Pharaoh's daughter as the Muthus. I got that right. Now Moses is three months old when Pharaoh's daughter draw, draws him from the Nile. Now think about it, did Amram and Jochebed give him a name when he was born three months earlier? Now if they did, we never told what Moses' original name was. Now Moses makes no attempt to reclaim his original Hebrew name if he was ever given one, after he later visits the affliction of his fellow Israelites. Now Jewish tradition though, gives several possible names as his original name. Now one is Tovia, meaning God is good. Another, Jekuthiel, from his mother, and Heba, from his father. Now, lessons from Joseph, we explore the evidence of Israel's time in the ancient Egyptian city of Avaris underneath the later 19th dynasty city of Pi Ramesses. Now, here is a map of Avaris showing the original path of the eastern branch of the Nile River as determined from lots of core samples. Now, you can see where the Semitic settlement was, and to the west of it is where the palace is likely to have been the residence of Joseph. Now north of that Semitic settlement area, there was a 12th dynasty palace that probably was used into the 13th dynasty as well. 
And this likely that Moses was born in the, in the Semitic settlement in the virus. Now traced here in light blue, the likely downstream path that the basket of Moses travelled from the Semitic settlement to the Middle Kingdom palace. Now Moses was brought up in the Egyptian royal court. Now Stephen in his famous speech in Acts 7 states that Moses learned all about the wisdom of the Egyptians. He also states that he was mighty in words and deeds. Now if that comment about being mighty in words is just talking about his early years before he fled to Midian, that's rather interesting when compared to his later complaint to God about not being eloquent and being slow of speech. Now, according to Josephus, he was appointed general of the army and won a battle against the Ethiopians after the Ethiopians made an incursion into Egypt. Now, Moses had military training, and this would include the logistics of moving and providing for a large army. Now, this training groomed him for the role that God had in mind for him later in leading Israel out of Egypt. And we see a glimpse of this training put into effect during the Exodus where we read in Exodus 13, 18, that Israel went out of Egypt in orderly ranks. Now chapters 9 and 10 of the second book of Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews give us an account of Moses' life before he flees to Midian. Now while some elements seem a little bit fanciful in Josephus' account, other elements in his record sound quite plausible. Now in the story of the conquest of Ethiopia, Josephus says Thardis was the daughter of the king of Ethiopia. Now his account says that she was impressed with his courage and fell for him and asked him to marry her. Now Moses only agreed on condition that she would help deliver up the city to her, to him. Now this was fulfilled and Moses followed through on his politically motivated marriage. Now you may remember this, the scene from the Ten Commandments movie with Thus is portrayed after Moses returns from a campaign to Ethiopia, though no mention is made of him marrying her in the movie, which is understandable given that the movie was made in 1956 and racial segregation was very much in force in the southern Bible belt. Now we'll hear more about Thus later in the story of Moses as she will later leave um, Egypt with the Israelites. Now in Hebrews 12, verse 27, we read, By faith in Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the riches of the treasures of Egypt. For he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible and quiet. Now at some point in time, a change or conversion took place in the heart of Moses. And neither the Bible nor Josephus gives any further details about how and when this change occurred other than what Paul tells us here. Now if Josephus is correct about Amram's vision, Moses' parents knew he would be the one to deliver Israel. Now we don't know when Moses learned about his Hebrew ancestry, which may have been hidden uh, to him as portrayed in Cecil B. Mills, maybe the Ten Commandments. Now once aware of his Hebrew ancestry, he no doubt would have sought out his family, and they probably did share the vision about him being the one to deliver the nation. So we would have had that direct confirmation from God by his father that he was to be Israel's deliverer. Now Paul implies quite a lot of knowledge about God's plan was passed onto him, which motivated his choice to suffer with his people. Now Hebrews 11.10 says that Abraham waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now Abraham understood about the future kingdom of God and the new Jerusalem which included inheriting eternal life as part of that. 
Now, Hebrews 11, 26 implies that Moses understood what Abraham knew, and that it included, a, included greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Now, it says that he looked to the reward. Now, he was brought up in the ways and religions of Egypt, so it would be very interesting to know how and why he came to feel that God and the religion of the Hebrews was superior to that of the Egyptians. Now, in the short term, Moses wouldn't experience those greater physical riches of the kingdom. In the short term, Moses could have had the passing pleasures of sin and the riches of Egypt. Now, this verse acknowledges that there is actually pleasure in sin. Now, the problem, though, with sin is the hurt that it later inflicts on ourselves and other people around us. Now, Moses could have lived a luxurious life with plenty of women, but he was willing to forsake those temporary pleasures and even prepare to suffer hurt in the short term. Now, in his book, Hero, Fred Steiger discusses his son's battle to study to study sexually pure during high school and college. Now on page 34 he writes this about his son. Jason's victory came from something far more basic and far more heroic. He took on the truest mark of manhood early on and never looked back. What mark? His complete willingness to embrace social pain for a higher cause. That gave him the strength to stand against all the opposition in the point. Now in like manner, Moses was willing to suffer affliction for a higher cause, the greater long-term reward of inter inheriting eternal life and being in God's kingdom. Now this brings us to the first lesson that we can learn from the life of Moses. Don't just focus on sin's short-term benefits. Focus instead on the long-term benefits of obeying God and the evil consequences of sin. Now, if you recall from Joseph's story where he's tempted by Potiphar's wife, he could have easily focused on the short-term pleasure of sin and given in to that temptation. Now, when one's hormones kick in and can create a kind of tunnel vision effect where all one can think of is the pleasure of what you're being tempted with. Now, Mark, Joseph, on the other hand, looked at sin from a holistic point of view. Yes, he saw the pleasure of sin, but he focused more on the bad side of that sinful action when he said, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now, we read in Acts 7.23 that Moses was 40 years old when he went to visit his fellow Israelites. Now, we have no details about how and when he learned about his Hebrew ancestry. Now, there's a good chance that it may have only happened that he found out just shortly to this when he was around 40 years old. Now, Exodus 2 tells the story this way. Now, it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way. And looked at one, and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting, and he said to the one who did the wrong, Why are you striking your companion? Then he said, Who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. Now Moses thought he was careful enough when he struck the cruel Egyptian over the sea of death, but someone obviously saw it and it got back to the Pharaoh. So before the king can follow up and execute him for this action, he appears to, um, even though he then flees to the land of Midian. Now Exodus 2.14 says that the Pharaoh sought to kill him, but he fled from the face of Pharaoh. Now the Ten Commandments movie gets it wrong and has him been caught by Ramses, who then chooses to send him off into the desert rather than kill him. Now the 
traditional view of the route of the Exodus is that the crossing of the Red Sea took place either at the top of the Gulf of Suez or through one of the Horn Lakes further north. And at Mount Sinai is Jebel Musa, located in the mountains in the southern end of the Sinai Peninsula. Now the Sinai Peninsula, particularly because of its copper mines, was under Egyptian control at the time of Moses. In fact, those copper mines uh, were where there was an Egyptian presence is relatively close to the traditional Mount Sinai, Jebel Musa. Now this point argues heavily against Jebel Musa being the true Mount Sinai, as Jethro was relatively close to Mount Sinai where Moses fled to. And the Apostle Paul in the New Testament in Galatians 4.25 wrote the following, For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, you see, we see here that he places Mount Sinai in Arabia. Now that said, in Roman times, when Paul wrote this, the Roman province known as Arabia Petra did include the Sinai Peninsula and parts of the Arabian Peninsula. However, when we go to Exodus 2.15, it says that when Moses fled from the ferry, he fled to the land of Midian. And when he, while he was there in Midian, tending sheep, God appeared to him and said, when you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. Now it's known that there is, universe, there is a, a universal agreement that Midian is actually in northwest Saudi Arabia. Now the biblical reference to Mount Sinai being in or close to Midian does appear to rule out the traditional site of Jebel Musa in the south of the Sinai Peninsula as that would be too far from Midian to travel on foot with Jethro's flocks. Not to mention how close Moses would be to the Sarah copper mines where there was an Egyptian military presence at that time. Now Moses would have fled right across the entire Sinai Peninsula to Midian in Arabia in order to ensure that he was beyond Pharaoh's control. Now in his book, The Exodus Mysteries of Midian, Sinai and Jabal el Laws, Len Fritz provides several geographical reasons for choosing Jabal el Makla in the Jabal el Laws range as the best candidate for Mount Sinai in the land of Midian. And we'll look further into this when we get into part four of what lessons from Moses. Now Moses then reaches a well where shepherds were pushing away the daughters of the priests of Midian. And Moses defends them, and hearing about this, the priest of Midian invites him into his clan and gives him one of his daughters to be his wife. Now Midian, if you remember when we looked at the life of Abraham, was one of six sons that Abraham had with his second wife, Keturah, after his first wife, Sarah, had died. Now Midian was a later son of Abraham, and at the latest and a later stepbrother of Isaac and Ishmael. Now his descendants settled in northwest Saudi Arabia. Now here in chapter 2, this priest of Midian is called Revel, as well as one other time in the book of Numbers. Now in the next two chapters, in Exodus 18, he is called Jethro, where he is also identified as Moses' father-in-law. So this priest has two names, perhaps one of them being a title, and the other being a personal name. Now, Ruel, or Jethro, gives him his daughter, Zipporah, as wife, who later bears him a son who he calls Gershom, meaning stranger, since he feels like a stranger in a foreign land. Now, Zipporah became his second wife, but from Moses' point of view, he would have presumed from, with his exile from Egypt that he would never see his first wife again. Levites later in the Bible. 
And this concur has to be that Moses and Aaron would come from. Now Moses' wife Zibra has a name that means bird. And their two sons were Gershon, the firstborn, whose name means stranger, and Eleazar, which means God is my help. Now Aaron's wife was actually from the tribe of Judah. Now, he married a woman by the name of Elisha, who was the daughter of Aminadab and the sister of Nashon. Now Aminadab and Nashon later appear in the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the Gospels. So we see here that Moses' sister-in-law was actually from the line of Judah that Jesus would be born through. Now we'll look at the little further the line of Aaron's family tree where we get to Mount Sinai and the setting of the priesthood. Now in Exodus 3 we then read about the story of God appearing to Moses in the burning bush that wasn't being consumed. And notice that a particular angel of the Lord here is equated with the Lord and with God. Now the word angel means messenger. Now this is likely to have been the God being who later became Jesus Christ as the messenger of God the Father. Now in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4, Paul said that the spiritual rock that was the with the Israelites coming out of Egypt was actually Christ. And we see in the story that Moses is told to take off his sandals from the place where he stood at that time was holy ground. Now there is a principle here of not defiling and treating with respect that which is holy, which can be applied with the holy time of God's Sabbath. Now later the tabernacle and the temple will be physical locations where God's actual presence was, though just for a time. Now after God tells Moses to go to Pharaoh and to bring Israel out of Egypt, Moses then asks God what is his personal name in case the Israelites ask him about it. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am, and the Hebrew word here is the word Haya, has sent me to you. Now what is interesting is that the Hebrew, that Hebrew word translated I am, Haya, is that same word that we see in Genesis 1 verse 2, that is translated either was or became, and it says that the earth was or became waste and void. And we then goes on to say, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of Yahweh, of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. Now many, <coughs> excuse me, many Jews and Messianic Jews claim that the personal name of God and only name of God that we can use is Yahweh or some variation of that. Now Yahweh is usually translated as Lord in all capitals in most English Bibles. Now the Lord Yahweh I'm sorry, but the word Yahweh simply means eternal or ever living one. It is just, a, just as much a description of God or title as any other name of God. Now, if this was God's personal name, then God would have never muddied the water by first saying, I am, has sent me to you. Now, in the New Testament, the words for Lord and God are actually the Greek words kurios, Theos, not some Hebrew or Aramaic version of it. And when Jesus told us how to pray, he didn't start with saying Yahweh, but with our Father. Now Abba, not to be confused with the 70s Swedish pop group, is Aramaic for Father. And Ab is the equivalent in Hebrew. But in the Greek translations of the Gospels, the Greek word Pater is actually used for our Father in the Lord's Prayer. Now Exodus chapter 4 can be somewhat confusing, so I'd like to go over it and help to clarify this somewhat confusing chapter. Now here is a summary of what happens in Exodus 4. In the first nine verses, God gives Moses three signs to use to get the Pharaoh's attention to show that God means business when he says, let my people go. 
Now after that, Moses tries to get out of being God's spokesman, which gets God a little bit grumpy. Now God offers Aaron to be his spokesman and says Aaron is already on his way from Egypt to meet him. Now in verse 18, Moses formally seeks permission to leave the clan to go to Egypt. Now remember when we went through the patriarchs, we saw that it was customary to gain permission from the patriarch, in this case Jethro, in order to leave the clan. In verse 19, God tells Moses, those who sought to kill him are dead. Now as the Pharaoh was one of those men who tried to kill him, this means that the Pharaoh had died and that a new Pharaoh was on the throne. Now this implies that the Pharaoh of Exodus only had a short reign of just a few years. Now the three main contenders for the Pharaoh of the Exodus from uh, Dynasties 18 and 19 put forth by those who support the standard chronology all have reigns between 30 and 60 years. Now in verse 20, Moses sets off for Egypt with his wife and sons. And then we have the incident of the circumcision which will unpack shortly. In verse 27, we read that the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him on the mountain of God, which is Mount Sinai. Now remember back a few verses in verse 14, that God said that Aaron was already on his way to meet him. Now God probably had Aaron uh, told Aaron to leave Egypt a couple of months earlier. Now as he was a slave, you have to wonder just how did he get away from Egypt to go and greet him. Moses. Now that in itself would be an interesting story that the Bible doesn't give us any details about. Now Aaron meets him probably very shortly after God appears to Moses at Mount Sinai in the burning bush. Now in the Ten Commandments movie, they mistakenly have Joshua instead of Aaron trek across the Sinai to meet Moses. Now in the hotter months in Midian, flocks would be taken off on the coastal plain up to the high eastern plateau where it would be a little bit cooler. Now Jethro was likely also up on the eastern plateau, not far away from Mount Sinai where Moses is. Now in verse 20 it says that Moses left for Egypt with his sons, yet only went back with Aaron in the end. Now in Exodus 18.2 we read after Moses led the Israelites to Mount Sinai that Jethro took his wife Zebra up, says after he had sent her back, and her two sons to meet Moses. So we see from that detail in Exodus 18 that he probably sent his wife and sons back after the circumcision incident, which we'll get sure. Now when we go to the next chapter, uh, in chapter 4 of Exodus, God gives Moses instructions on what to do when he goes to the Pharaoh, and then Moses twice shirks from doing what God has asked him to do. First, he says that he was not eloquent and that he was slow of speech and tongue. And this may or may not have included a stutter. Now, I've got a friend in the Brisbane church who has a slight stutter, and that may have been what Moses was, was like. So, how does God respond to Moses' low view of himself? Well, God points Moses back to himself and says, Who gave human beings their tongue, their mouths? Who made them? made them deaf or mute. Now go and I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. Now after Moses asks God to send someone else, then God gets a little bit grumpy at Moses, but kindly then offers to send Aaron as his spokesman. Now today we might say that Moses had a bit of a problem with low self-esteem at this time, which raises the question of how much we should estimate or esteem ourselves. Now at the end of the book of Job, when God, Job repented, he said, Therefore I abhor or hate myself and repent in dust and ashes. And God also says in Ezekiel 36, 31, that Israel will loathe themselves when they repent after the great tribulation. Now on the other hand, God tells us to love others as we love ourselves. Now if we treat others as we treat ourselves, and we hate ourselves, 
That would be we would hate others as well. So, does God want us to think highly of ourselves or little of ourselves? Well, the answer to that question is both. In fact, there is a right and a wrong way to think highly of ourselves, and there's also a right and a wrong way to think low of ourselves. Now, let's look at each of those four ways in which we can view ourselves. Now, the wrong way that we can view ourselves highly is labeled in the Bible as pride, where we think too highly of ourselves apart from God and often look down on others, thinking we are much better than they are. Now, humility, the right form of low self esteem, is where we recognise everything we have comes from God and that we are naturally inclined towards sin without God's help and power. Now being humble means putting the needs of others and obeying God ahead of our own self will. Now, if our insecurities, like what happened with Moses, get in the way of our ability to do what God wants us to do and to love others as we should, then we have a problem. Now some well-meaning people mislabel insecurity as humility, but there is a significant difference between the two. A humble person does not spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about his or her own flaws. A humble person does not need to undervalue or disparage themselves. They are far too busy engaging in the world beyond their own self-drama. Now the right form of high self-esteem is rejoicing and having confidence in how much God values us and how much he wants to help and bless us and that he always has our back despite our weaknesses. Now we have an expression that we often use when it comes to how we view other people. Love the sinner, but hate the sin. Now that expression doesn't just apply to how we should view other people, but it also applies to how we should view ourselves. We should love the sinner, our talents and the unique personality that God himself created in us, but we should hate the sin our sins and our natural tendency towards sin. Now this brings us to our second lesson that we can learn from the life of Moses. Choose to act on faith and not fear when you feel afraid and insecure. Trust that God always loves you and will back you up when you are striving to live his way. Now Moses acted on fear and gave excuses initially but later he would begin to grow past that and immediately move forward and do God's will, trusting that God would back him up. Now, if you were to make a short list of the strangest paragraphs in the Bible, this circumcision incident in Exodus 4 would almost certainly have to be about. Now, Moses and his family have started off for Egypt when we read. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Your first reaction when reading that is, say what? And God has chosen Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and suddenly God seeks to kill him. For what reason would he do such a thing? And it <clears throat> carries on to say, then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of his son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. A part of God's covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob was the acknowledgement of that covenant through the act of circumcision. Whoever was not circumcised amongst the males of God's people would be cut off or destroyed from amongst them. Now Nelson's study Bible states that the Midianites practiced circumcision on a groom right before his marriage instead of circumcising male infants. Many of Israel's neighboring peoples practiced circumcision, but none except Israel circumcised infants. And a quote. Now Genesis 17, 12 specifically notes circumcision was to be done on the eighth day after a male was born. Now Zephyr's words that followed, surely you are a 
husband not lied to me, indicate that she was opposed to infant circumcision. So Moses did not perform the circumcision in order to please her. Now as only one son here was circumcised in this incident, Moses may have compromised by only circumcising Gershon as a baby, but not Eliezer. However, God would not accept this compromise. When Zipporah saw that the Lord who appeared there physically would take her husband's life for failing to circumcise one of the sons, she did it herself, albeit with reluctance and resentment. Now it appears that Moses was incapacitated by whatever means God was using to slow and kill him, that he was unable to do it himself, so Zipporah did it. Now some commentators suggest that Moses struck, God struck Moses with a very serious illness where he had a seizure. Now Moses, God's chosen leader, has so far declined to follow God's instructions regarding circumcision, so God acted to set things right in a rather unusual way. Now this brings us to the third lesson that we can learn from the life of Moses. If you're going to lead in the church, you need to be faithfully leading your own family. Now, Kiel and Delitzsch, in their um, commentary on the Old Testament, Pentecost, Pentecost, write the following. If Moses was to carry out the divine commission with success, he must first of all prove himself to be a faithful servant of Jehovah in his own house. Quote. Now, if you're going to step out as a leader of God's people, then you have to be leading your own family faithfully. Get yourself sorted out and make sure your wife and yourself are on the same page before you attempt to function as a leader or officer in the church. Now regarding the qualifications for a church elder, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 3 verses 4 and 5, He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Now, as we looked at in part one, none of these pharaohs shown here, Thomas III or Amenhotep the second of the 18th dynasty, nor Ramses the Great of the 19th dynasty, as portrayed in the Ten Commandments movie, were the pharaoh of the Exodus. Now, we saw evidence that places the Exodus much earlier on Egypt's timeline in the 13th dynasty. So, if none of these guys were the pharaoh of the Exodus, then who was? Do we have a definite candidate? Well, the answer to that question is not quite, but we do have a few leading contenders. Now, the plagues of Egypt brought an end to the Middle Kingdom, devastating Egypt, leaving it vulnerable to the Asiatic Hyksos, who conquered Egypt without a battle, as noted by Benito. They then occupied the site that Bitek identified as Avaris. Now, Manetho says of them in this time, Tatamahes, in his reign, I do not know why, a blast of God's displeasure broke upon us. A people of a noble origin from the east, whose coming was unforeseen, had the audacity to invade the country which they mastered by main force without difficulty or even a battle. Quote. Now, since Pharaoh has been by many names, can we identify just who this Pharaoh was? in the listing of kings of the dynasties that ruled Egypt. Now there are only two kings from Dynasty 13 noted on the Sothis list. Now if Donovan Cole's interpretation is correct of the Sothis list, that they contain only the primary rulers in Egypt, then these were the last two pharaohs before the Exodus and their names on the Sothis list are Ramesses and Konkaras. Now, Exodus 2 implies that the last pharaoh ruled only a short period of time. Now, verse 23 implies God finally acted and sent Moses back to Egypt soon after the death of a previous pharaoh. Now, the last pharaoh noted here from Genesis 13 on the Sophist list, Concarus ruled for only five years, fitting in well with that view. Now, the historian Asidius recorded that the wife a man by the name of Caneferes raised Moses. Now this foster father of Moses is likely to have been the second last king that we looked at before the Exodus. Now 
reversing the rules by which Egyptian names are transliterated into Greek. The name Kineferis transliterates back to Egyptian as Ka Nefer Ra. Now, there's actually a 13th dynasty king called Ka Nefer Ra in the Turin list. And this is the person who um, Corval believes was Moses' foster father. And he is known also as he was known also as Sadiqotep the Fourth. And here's a statue of him that is in the Louvre Museum in Paris. Now, according to Corval, he married Sadiq Nefru Ray, a daughter of the last 12th dynasty king. Now, he assumed primary ruler over Egypt after the death of his father-in-law, the last 12th dynasty king and reigned for 29 years according to the Sophist list. Now, Assyrius also recorded legendary evidence that the pharaoh of the Exodus was called King Kerys. Now, King Kerys is very close to that King Karis that we saw on the Sophist list as the last pharaoh. Now, if we transliterate the Greek name King Kerys, we get the Egyptian name of Ka and Ra. And can we find a pharaoh by the name of Ka and Ra on another list such as the Turin list? Now here are two copies of the Turin list. The one on the left is quoted from Donovan Corville's book, The Exodus Problem and Its Ramifications. The Turin list on the right comes from another online source. Now remember that the pharaohs had multiple names, so we often find the same pharaohs on different lists with different names. Now in both Turin listings that are shown here, we have the name Kar Nefera, which matches the name for Moses' likely foster father. Now he's also known as Sobek Hotep IV. Now Corville gives his alternate name as Sobek Hotep V rather than the fourth, as there has been a renumbering of these kings since Corville wrote his book in the 1970s. Now as noted in the bottom yellow box here, the Greek, the Greek Kineferes, noted by Eusebius as the pharaoh of the Exodus, is equivalent to Ka and Ra in Egyptian. And on Corval's Turin list, we actually do have a Ka and Ra, who is number 26 on his Turin listing. Now Corval gives him an alternate name of Sobek Hotep the sixth. Now unfortunately, I cannot find independent confirmation of Corval's king number 26, Ka and Ra in the Turin listing on the right. So Corville's data may be wrong, and we may have to find another candidate on the Turin list on the right. Now since we cannot confirm a Ka and Ra in the Turin listing on the right, there are three other possibilities for the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Now our second candidate is the Pharaoh who, in the Turin list on the right, is the first named Pharaoh after Moses' likely foster father. Now highlighted here in light blue on both listings, he is the Pharaoh known as Ka Hotep Ra, who is also known as Sobek Hotep the Sixth. Now Sobek Hotep the Sixth is the alternate name given by Corville for his candidate Ka Ankh Ra. Now, now we come to our third candidate, now he was the pharaoh known today as Sobek Hotep the Fifth, but early on, back when Corval wrote his book, he was known as so Sobek Hotep the Sixth, the same numbered pharaoh as Corval's candidate for the Exodus pharaoh Ka Ankh Ra. Now he is shown here in dark blue on both lists with the name Mer Hotep Ra. Now he's actually shown a few pharaohs after on the Turin list, which differs from the order that Egyptologists recognise today for Dynasty 13. Now our fourth candidate is David Roll's candidate for the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Now his name is Dudamos, and he's a Pharaoh number 38 on the Turin listing on the left, shown here in purple. Now the name Dudamos is roughly similar to the name Tatamaeus, who Manetho says was ruling when the Hyksos conquered Egypt after they were devastated by the plagues. Now Corville sees the possibility of some parallel rule between the multitude of Dynasty 13 kings, and he suggests that Dudamos perhaps was a lesser king at the time of the Exodus under one of the earlier rulers. 
So we have here at least four possibilities for the Pharaoh of the Exodus using the Turin listings shown here. Now we don't have any images or statues of David Roll's candidate Dudamize, but we do have statues of our last two contenders, Sobek Hotep V and Sobek Hotep the Sixth. Now shall we see what our two of our main contenders for the Pharaoh of the Exodus actually look like? Well, here they are. The statue of Sobek Hotep V is in the Cairo Museum. And the statue of Sobek Hotep VI is in the Altus Museum in Berlin. Now, according to Wikipedia, they both ruled for three and four years respectively, which is close to the five years noted for Concarus in the Sothis list, which fits what is implied in Exodus chapter 2. Now, Sobek Hotep V here on the left is actually shown wearing the crown of southern Egypt. Now, if he was based in the south, then our guy on the right might have been the pharaoh of the Exodus if he was based in the north. Now, my money is probably on the guy on the right, though it could go either way, or it even may have been that later pharaoh, Dudamos. So whoever was the pharaoh that Moses dealt with, his rule came to a crashing end with the plagues of Egypt through which God would deliver Israel from slavery. The stubborn pharaoh would lose his life in the Red Sea in pursuit of the Israelites. The loss of the Egyptian army left it defenceless as the Hyksos invaded the land and took over Egypt for hundreds of years, bringing an end to the Middle Kingdom. And so on that note, we will conclude part two of lessons from Moses and Exodus. And in part three, we'll continue the story of Moses as he confronts the Pharaoh and God brings judgment on the nation of Egypt with ten mighty plagues that will bring the nation and the Pharaoh to its knees. I look forward to sharing all that with you in part three on message <clears throat> lessons from Moses and Exodus with you next time. I'd love hearing you in your life. Good afternoon and happy Sabbath uh, to you all. I hope you're having a great Sabbath. It was a very steamy hot uh, day when we got today. Now, it's good to be back up here again. Uh, I was a little bit surprised that I was scheduled again after only being up here about a couple of weeks ago. Now last time in uh, part two of Lessons from Moses and Exodus, we covered the story of Moses from his birth up until he returned uh, back to Egypt following his 40-year exile in the land of Midian. Now today, in part three, we'll cover the story of his confrontation with the Pharaoh, which sees God bring ten plagues on Egypt, forcing them to allow Israel to leave. Now after that, we'll cover the story of the Exodus up until they cross the Red Sea. Now when Moses and Aaron first approached Pharaoh in Exodus 5, they told him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Now what was this feast day and where was this place in the wilderness that was three days' journey away? Now we're told that the first plague of blood lasts for seven days and it's quite likely that the total time for the plagues may have been around about a couple of months or so. So Moses and Aaron are confronting Pharaoh here some two to three months before Passover and unleavened bread. And this feast would have likely have been the feast of unleavened bread which itself pictures coming out of Egypt. Now it's likely that the term three days journey is a reference to the speed of an army marching for that period of time. Now if so, how far would that be? Well a typical Roman legion would travel about uh, 50 kilometres or 30 miles in a day. Now if we multiply that by three, you get 150 kilometres or 90 miles for three days journey. Now Glenn Fritz proposes an average travel time for the Israelites of half the rate shown here for an army. Now he proposes that they travel 15 miles or 25 kilometres per day. Now if they walked 10 hours in a day, that would be about one and a half miles.
miles or two and a half kilometers per hour, which is basically a slow walking pace. Now from Avaris, where they left, um, which was earlier called Ramses, the distance an army can cover in three days is shown by the blue circle on this map. Now the traditional site of Sukkoth is only one day's journey from Avaris, and there's no obvious place that's three days march from Avaris where they would go for a feast day. There's nothing but wilderness, and Midian, where we've seen that Sinai is to be found, is way too far away to be in this location, even going by a chariot. Now some have proposed Serebet el Kadim, where many workers from Egypt worked its mines during the Middle Kingdom period, and have proposed that they got there by the last day of unleavened bread, after leaving on the first day of unleavened bread. However, it would take the Israelites 11 days, not six days to travel that distance, and an army would take six days, not three days journey. Now, my best guess as to what this three days journey is a reference to uh, could be the distance from Pelusium, the, the very on the very eastern edge of the Nile Delta, to El Arish, uh, which is the, um, El Arish was the location where the border was between Egypt and Palestine. Now, it's actually known that that distance between Pelusium and El Arish was about three days journey. So I, sus sorry, I suspect that the term three days journey into the wilderness might actually be a euphemism for leaving Egypt altogether and crossing into the promised land to keep the feast, even though they would end up going a different route to Midian and Mount Sinai. Now during the reign of one of the kings named Sesostris of the Middle Kingdom, a canal and wall were constructed where the Suez Canal is today. Now that canal was full of crocodiles and it was constructed to help protect Egypt from invaders from the east who would try and attack by land. Now John Kaiser in an article about this wall and canal called it the Berlin Wall of Egypt. Now it also served the double purpose of stopping the progress of anyone trying to leave Egypt without authorization. Now this is why the Israelites couldn't easily leave Egypt and why Moses asked permission of the Pharaoh for them to leave Egypt. Now the evidence of this wall and moat makes one wonder just how Moses and his brother Aaron were able to leave Egypt for Midian before the Exodus. That's an interesting story we'll find out one day. Now this barrier here was referred to the Egyptians as by the term of Anu, which in Hebrew translates as Shur, meaning wall or enclosure. Now the desert to the east of this wall was known as the Wilderness of Shur, which is mentioned several times in the Bible. Now in their first unsuccessful meeting with Pharaoh, Moses and Aaron asked to be able to leave Egypt to keep a feast, lest God bring something bad on us Israelites. Now there's no threat to the Egyptians, and Moses does not even use any of the signs that God told him to use so we still see here a degree of timidity on the part of Moses. Now Pharaoh then says, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Now Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no longer give this people straw to make bricks as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it. Now the Israelites are not at all happy with the outcome of this pitiful first meeting with Pharaoh. They tell Moses, Let the Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us a bite in the sight of Pharaoh to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Now Moses indulges in some selfish self-pity complaints to God, saying, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it that you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, neither have you delivered your people at all. Now at the end of chapter 6, Moses continues to pout, giving in to his insecurity yet again. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I am the Lord. 
Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh heed me? And then God basically tells him to what I will tell you, and even tells him that the Pharaoh's heart will remain hard. He reminds Moses to use his rod and perform the miracles that they had practiced earlier on their way to Egypt. Now to show God's power, Aaron cast his rod down and it turned into a serpent. Now amazingly, Pharaoh's magicians were able to replicate this very same miracle. Now Satan and his demons, when allowed by God, can perform miraculous signs. A second Thessalonians 2 talks about with the false prophet who can perform miracles by the power of the devil. Now Adam Clark in his commentary states, it was necessary that God should permit Pharaoh's wise men to act to the utmost of their skill in order to imitate the work of God, that his superiority might be clearly seen and his powerful working incontestably ascertained. And this was fully done when Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods in the quote. Now in the New Testament of 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 8, we actually have recorded the names of two of the chief of these magicians, the, the names of Yanis and Yamrates. Now not only were the magicians able to replicate the miracle of turning a rod into a serpent, it appears that in a smaller manner they were able to turn some water into blood and bring up some frogs. Now why they wanted to add to those plagues seems silly to me when it would be much, much better trying to reverse what Moses was able to do. Now when we get to the third plague of lice, they could not replicate or reverse that plague. And the last mention of these magicians is them suffering with boils like the rest of the Egyptians. Now as part of God's judgment on Egypt and to force Pharaoh and the Egyptians to let the Israelites go, God pours out ten plagues. Now God starts with turning the Nile's water into blood, followed by plagues of frogs, lice, flies, livestock disease, boils, hail mingled with fire, locusts, darkness, and then the death of the firstborn. Now scholars and scientists over the years have come up with different ideas to explain the ten plagues, and even come up with an integrated model that ties them all together. Now how people view the plagues of Egypt mainly comes down to their worldview. Now, if they are an atheist, they will write off the supernatural and just look for extraordinarily but purely natural phenomena to explain them. Now, if you believe in God, then you'll be open to God performing supernatural things and or using natural phenomena to do his bidding. Now, let's take a look at a couple of those different views that attempt to explain the plagues of Egypt. Now, no doubt the most radical theory on the plagues <coughs> me, comes from Jewish scholar Emanuel Velkowski in his controversial best-selling book from 1950 called Worlds in Collision. Now, even if none of it were true, it would make for a fantastic science fiction novel. Now, it's basically divided into two acts. The first act deals with the events of the plagues of Egypt and the Exodus. The second act deals with the events from Isaiah's great earthquake to Hezekiah and the sun going backwards 10 degrees. Now his radical theory for the first act sees Venus born as a newborn planet and threatening the earth and God using it to bring about many of the plagues of Egypt. Now Velkowski believes that the red iron sulphide dust from Venus um, picture the iron dust of WA or on the planet Mars caused the water to look like blood and kill the fish. And then there's an ecological chain reaction. Now Velikovsky believed that the hail mingled with fire were fiery meteorites and the darkness was caused by Venus 
passing in between the sun and the earth, even though Goshen, we're told, had light. Now he says the last plague is being caused by a great earthquake as Venus passes very close. And he interprets firstborn as chosen due to their similarity in Hebrew. Now the second act in the story occurs after Venus crosses paths with Mars and sends Mars threatening the earth each 15 years from Isaiah's great earthquake until the end of Hezekiah's reign when the Assyrian army were destroyed. Now there is actually ancient evidence as well as evidence from the story of the flood in the Bible that does appear to support a change in the length of the year from 360 to 365 and a quarter days. Now such a change in the Earth's orbit potentially could have been caused by a large heavenly body pulling the Earth into a different orbit. However, the evidence for this occurs close to the time of Hezekiah and not at the time of the, of the Exodus. Now the major thing counting against Velikovsky's Venus theory in the first act is the archaeological evidence. Now if a massive heavenly body threatened the Earth during the Middle Bronze Age, when the Israelites left, you would expect to see the sort of massively widespread damage that we actually do see at the end of the early Bronze Age and also at the end of the late Bronze Age collapse. Now the Middle Bronze Age destructions are on a much lesser scale and more in keeping with destruction by men. For example, when the Israelites got to Canaan, they didn't find cities recovering from severe destruction a few decades earlier, but strong cities with high walls. Now while I do have some serious doubts about his Venus theory for the plagues, I would agree with him on, on the hail mingled with fire being far more likely to be meteorites than icy hail. Now Velikovsky's template of the potential effects of the passing of a large heavenly body is very interesting in relation to the plagues of the day of the Lord, where many of the same plagues are repeat, repeated at that time. In Revelation, the Bible is much more explicit about a, a number of those plagues having a cosmic origin. Now, another theory of the plagues comes from John S. Martin and Curtis Malloy, who are both epidemiologists that was featured in a 1996 Discovery Channel documentary called The Ten Plagues of Egypt. Now their secular worldview meant that they looked for purely natural causes to explain the plagues, which only works up to a certain point. Now both of these scientists, and a friend of mine who supports Velikovsky's theory, independently have come to the conclusion that the animal plagues from plagues two to six as well as the eighth plague of locusts, are essentially an ecological chain reaction or a domino effect. Now, algal blooms, toxic to fish, are known to happen in seawater. Now, they release red pigment, causing red tides, and kill fish in millions today. Now, Fisteria algae could have caused the first plague and turned the Nile uh, red. Now the word translated frogs actually includes toads and a common species in Egypt is the bufo toad. Now in some species individuals produce thousands of eggs. Now with no fish to feed on those eggs, toads by the millions would hatch and then abandon the toxic river. Many would have headed uh, for warmth and light, hence they went to the houses and the ovens of the Egyptians. Now away from their normal river of habitat, the toads then all died. Young frogs by the millions, unable to find further food or make their way back to the river, now die in heaps all at once, creating a sanitation problem. Now as these are swept into piles for burning where possible, the remainder decay and are a breeding ground for the flies and insects that escape the frogs because they were in pupil or larval stage at the time. Now these insects, now without predators and a plentiful supply of frog carcasses, now experience a wave of population explosion. 
Now, Mara Malloy identified the family of midges known as Caleucides as the lice of Plague 3 and the carriers of the disease that caused Plague 5 that kills the livestock. Now, midges, thrive, sorry, midges thrive around stagnant water with decaying vegetation and animal matter. A larvae feeding on this would produce great plague numbers of midges. Now they identify the stable flies as the most likely species for plague four, as they lay up to 500 eggs more than any other fly and deliver painful bites. The plague of the livestock they identify as African horse sickness and or blue tongue virus, which are both viruses spread by the same insect carrier, the midge called glucodes. Now plague six boils affect both man and beast. Now a disease which affects both man and beast is glanders disease. And glanders infects horses, sheep and pigs, as well as humans. And it causes boils and could be carried by the stable fly. Now they believe that the hail mingled with fire was just a severe hail of ice and completely missed the detail of the, the uh, fire being mingled with that hail. Now they see locusts then on the move due to climate disruption, followed by a severe desert sandstorm causing darkness for several days. Now they have a naturalistic explanation for the last plague that, like Velikovsky's view, does not take the firstborn literally. Now imagine crops wet from hail, contaminated with locust feces, stored underground and warmed without vent ventilation, under layers of sand. Now moulds that grow on food would have proliferated. Now some moulds uh, produce potent mitotoxins that can kill humans and animals. Now they speculate that the people who entered the granaries first and or ate first would be the dominant and socially powerful. Now these would have inhaled the airborne mitotoxins released by the fungi or been poisoned directly by eating. The Stradivirus atria can kill within hours by internal bleeding into lungs and intestines. Similarly, the dominant animals would have been selectively fed to save them, or the dominant animals would eat first of their own accord. Now that's one explanation for naturalistic explanation for the death of the first one, though. Personally, I don't see that as sufficient to properly explain what we do see in the scriptures. Now when God spoke about the judgment that he would bring upon Egypt with the last plague, he also states in Exodus 12, 23, against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. Now quite a number of the plagues were done to show God's supremacy over the false gods of Egypt. Now the Egyptians probably desperately prayed, prayed, sorry, prayed to their gods to stop each of those plagues. Now the Apis bull god could not stop the death of the cattle, nor could Ra, the sun god, stop the, the plague of darkness. In every case, their gods were powerless and silent over the Hebrew god. Now the Nile was the lifeblood of Egypt, and the human, Egyptians worshipped several gods who were responsible to watch over it, such as Nun and Harpy. Now Adam Clark also notes in his commentary, the plague of the bloody waters may be considered as a display of retributive justice against the Egyptians for the murderous decree which enacted that all the male children of the Israelites should be drowned in that river, the waters of which so necessary to support and, and their life and their pride. Now the Nile and all the ponds as well as water and buckets and pitchers were all turned to, uh, to blood. Now as the Egyptians had to dig to find drinkable water, this indicates what turned the water into blood was more likely to have been an airborne agent that fell on the waters rather than a toxic algal plague. The first plague we saw last for seven days. Now with no fish to feed on the eggs, frogs by the millions would hatch and then abandon the toxic river. As they die competing for food, their dead bodies created a sanitation problem, leading to plagues of insects that also carry diseases 
such as that which affects the livestock and the boils on man and beast. Now such plagues might be written off as a natural event, but God then does something to prove that what is happening is by his supernatural hand, which is spoken of in Exodus 8, verses 22 and 23. Now, the UCG Bible reading program in its commentary on this verse says the following. Before sending the fourth plague, God says that he'll prevent it and the remainder of the plagues from afflicting the Israelites in Goshen. Thus, the first three plagues had been experienced by everyone, including the Israelites. But the seven last plagues, out of ten, afflict the um, Egyptians only. That the seven last plagues are distinct is quite interesting in the light of the fact that we actually find this phrase in Revelation 15 verse 1 in reference to the final plagues poured out on rebellious mankind following a period of suffering that will come upon God's people, physical and spiritual, and on the rest of the world. And just as in Egypt, God's people of the end time will be spared the seven last plagues. End of quote. Now what we have to remember in relation to God's protecting hand on the Israelites in Goshen is just how close Pharaoh they were to Pharaoh's palace there in Avaris. Now this was a point brought out recently in a presentation on the Israelites in Egypt that Mark Robertson gave in Brisbane. Now it would have been walking distance between where the um, Ark was set, to, sorry, it would have been walking distance between where the Ark of Moses was set free and where Pharaoh's daughter picked up it up along the river when she went to bathe. And Moses and Aaron were summoned by Pharaoh by night and told to leave Egypt in Exodus 12. So Pharaoh was probably not at one of his palaces at On or Memphis near Cairo, but likely at his palace at Avaris, very close to the Israelites which had a royal precinct, as has been uncovered by archaeologists. Now, the Israelites built it as a garrison city for Pharaoh or military base because of its strategic location on the Nile. Now, as I mentioned previously, the hail which fell during the seventh plague is more likely to be fiery meteorites than hail of ice. Now after the latest plague came the plague of intense darkness for three days which is miraculously contrasted by the Israelites having light in their dwellings. Now how are we to understand the expression that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Now if we look at each of the plagues and notice who hardens Pharaoh's heart, we'll notice for the plagues 1 to 5 and plague 7 that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Now after the second plague hit, Pharaoh said he would let Israel go and sacrifice to the Lord, but reneged when there was relief from the frog plague. Now he similarly reneged after the seventh plague of hail mingled with fire. Now after the plague of darkness, we read that Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Let your little ones go also go out with you. But Moses said, You must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also shall go out with us, not a hoof shall be left behind. For we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God. And even we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he again would not let them go. Again, Pharaoh reneged. Now when it says that the Lord of Pharaoh um, hardened Pharaoh's heart, it is, it is unlikely to be a direct temptation to sin, as James says in James 1.13, that God tempts no one to evil. Now when God hardens someone's heart, it's more likely to be external circumstances that he sets up that provokes the Pharaoh's pride and he gets his back up and chooses to be stubborn and self-willed. Now in Exodus 11, God says to Moses that there will be one more plague which will finally cause Pharaoh to release the Israelites. 
And the firstborn males of the Egyptians, of their non-Israelite servants and of their animals would surely die from the palace of Pharaoh to the dungeons. Perhaps this was in part a deserved punishment for the Egyptian slaughtering of God's children, the Israelite infants in previous generations going back to the time of Moses' birth. Now God told the Israelites to ask the Egyptians for silver and gold, gold items, in effect compensation for their years of slave labour. After all, the Egyptians had witnessed they were not about to complain. But Pharaoh's heart was still hardened, even threatening Moses' life. And Moses then, having delivered the final warning, storms out in anger. So we see here that the spoiling of the Egyptians began even before the last plague and probably continued on that day after that last plague. Now the Edward Papyrus, which is in the Lade Museum in Holland, appears to be an Egyptian record of the plagues of Egypt, which it bears a most eerie similarity to. Now John Wilson, in his book The Admonitions of Ippawa, based on its language and orthography, dates this document to the 13th dynasty during the Middle Kingdom in the Middle Bronze Age, which we've seen as the best place to place the Exodus. Now some of its passages read as follows. Plague stalks through the land, and blood is everywhere. Nay, but the river is blood. Trees are destroyed. No fruit nor herbs are found. Gates, columns, and walls are consumed by fire. The land is not light. He who places his brother in the ground is everywhere. People are stripped of clothes. Their slain takes bleed and fine. Gold, silver, lapis lazuli, and turquoise are strung on the necks of female slaves. These stranger people from without are come into Egypt. Now one uh, critic of this document being a true historical record stated that it was fictional because it was contradictory, giving the example that in one place it says that the whole land is in great want, while at the same time female slaves, slaves become rich. Now, ironically, this specific detail is just is one of the best proofs linking it with the time of the Exodus, as the Bible tells us that just before the last plague, the Israelites took their spoil from the Egyptians before leaving Egypt. Now, the Passover instructions for this festival were given when Israel was still in Egypt a couple of months before the law was given at Mount Sinai. Now we read in Exodus 12 that God told them to select an unblemished lamb and kill it at twilight on the 14th day between sunset and when it got dark. They were to take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and lintel of their houses. They were to eat, they were to roast the lamb whole, which would take quite a few hours to cook, and then eat it with unleavened bread and bits of herbs. Now verse 27 tells us the meaning of this festival. It was to celebrate when God passed over the houses of Egypt in Egypt that were marked with the blood of the lamb when he struck the Egyptians and delivered the Israelites. So we see here that Passover celebrates when God passed over Israel and spared them losing their firstborn children during the last of the ten plagues. Now the blood on the doorposts and the blood on the lintel some of which probably dropped on the ground, effectively formed the shape of the cross. And Passover foreshadowed the Christian meaning of this day when Jesus passed over our sins through the blood of his sacrifice. Now we have to bear in mind that God's calendar, in God's calendar, the days start at sunset, not at midnight. Now the first month of the year was originally called Abib, meaning green ears, but at a later time, Nisim was also used for it after the Babylonian exile. Now the Jews today, and, and some in the Church of God, argue that on the original Passover, the lambs were killed, not at the beginning, but near the end of the 14th of Abib, and were eaten on the night of the 15th, and then the Israelites left Egypt later on that same night that they ate the Passover. Now, if this view was correct, then God passed over 
and protecting Israel from the last plague, not on the 14th, but on the 15th of Abu. Now, if that were the case, why would then God tell Israel that the Lord's Passover was on the 14th? Now, if this view were correct, then Israel would also have violated one of the instructions to keep the Passover in Exodus 12, verse 22, which says that no one was to leave his house until the morning. Now, what we have to remember is that the Israelites who left Egypt numbered around about 2 million people, which is about the size of Brisbane. Imagine trying to move that many people at one time. Now Moses was summoned to the Pharaoh after he lost his son to tell them that they could leave, and this would have happened after midnight. Now to round up two million people at the beginning of the Exodus would have been a logistical nightmare in less than five hours of darkness. Now at some point in time in their history, the Jews ended up changing the way that they kept the Passover. Now in the process of doing so, they effectively merged the Passover to be celebrated on the 14th with the night to be much remembered on the following evening of the 15th, which celebrated the night that they left Egypt. Now Jesus Christ had a meal with his disciples in a guest room the night before he was killed. Now this meal was called, this meal was called the Passover according to Mark 14 verse 14 and several other verses in the Gospels. Now it is clear from John 18 verse 28 that the Jews who were involved in arresting and putting Jesus on trial were not keeping the Passover as, on the same night as Jesus and the disciples. Now after they arrested Jesus they did not want to go into where Pilate was as they did not want to be considered unclean before they would eat the Passover. So we see here a clear difference over the night that the Jews kept the Passover and the night that, the, that Jesus kept the Passover. Now some suggest that knowing that he would be killed before he ate the Passover, that Jesus moved his observance back a night, but there is not, not so much as a hint that Jesus ever did such a thing. Now Jesus was keeping the Passover on the same night that the Israelites kept the original Passover on the night of the 14th of Abib, the same night that God killed the firstborn of Egypt and spared the Israelites. Now these two great back-to-back -back feasts, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, celebrated two different events. One, the passing over and sparing of their lives by God, and the other, their coming out of Egypt. They celebrate different events that occurred on two consecutive but different days and should not be merged as the Jews do at this time. Now we read the final conclusion of the plagues of Egypt that God used to set the Israelites free in Exodus 12 where we read the following. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he, all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Then he called for Moses and Aaron by night, and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go and serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, We shall all be dead. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favour in the sight of the Egyptians so that they granted them what they requested. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. So finally, after a slavery of about 100 years, and some 430 years after Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, the Israelites are free and can leave Egypt. Now on the night of Nisan 15, following the Passover and the death of the firstborn, we read in Exodus 12 verses 41 and 42. 
And came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Now there are a couple of things to note in this passage. Now Paul talks about there being 430 years from the promises to Abraham and the giving of the law in Galatians 3. The very same 430 years have been spoken of here. Now it appears that the that the Exodus took place 430 years to the day that Abraham left Mesopotamia for the land of Canaan, which fits in well with the symbolism of coming out of Egypt and coming out of sin. Now, the other unusual thing to note in this passage is that they celebrate the special annual Sabbath, the first day of the Eleven Bread Festival, by hours of walking out of Egypt at night time, which is not something you usually associate with keeping a Sabbath. Now their hours of walking was an exception to the rule of, of resting on the Sabbath. Now the reason for this exception was by doing so, they were quite literally fulfilling the meaning of this day by coming out of Egypt, which spiritually symbolises leaving sin. Now many sceptics scoff at the idea that so many Israelites crossed the desert in the Sinai Peninsula with all their flocks and herds saying there wouldn't have been enough provisions and so forth to keep them going. Now what's interesting to note in Psalm 68 is it says twice that God provided plentiful rain for them on their journey. Now one route favoured by Glenn Fritz through the northern, northern centre of the Sinai Peninsula has the Israelites traversing what is for most of its length. Now these usually dry valleys quickly fill up during heavy rain and can cause flash floods. Now during a good rainy season there is ample water for flocks and herds as seen in this picture from that area. Now, it really is quite amazing how much grass can actually grow in semi-arid desert after some very good rain. Now we saw this in particular in 2010 in outback Queensland with the amazing transformation that went on after a rare um, massive drenching of rain. And one other thing we have to remember with regards to the Exodus journey out of Egypt is that much climate and topographical change has possibly occurred since that time and that the Sinai was not mostly arid as it is at this time. Now C.C. Robertson explains in his book on the track of the Exodus that the great central plateau forming the basin of the river El Arish provided ample pasture land. Leone Katani holds that the El Arish was a great stream within historic times. Although desert country extended to east and west, there would be pasture and arable land like the south, country south of Gaza at the present day where the barley harvest is enormous in a quote. Now the word wilderness does not always mean arid or semi-arid desert. It simply means a sparsely settled area. Now there's a common idea that the, um, the body of water that the Israelites crossed, uh, which is called the Red Sea in the Bible, was one of the eastern lakes where the Suez Canal is today. Now this viewpoint has in part been developed by secular scholars trying to find a natural explanation for the parting of the Red Sea and not rely on a miracle from God, as well as developing from a different interpretation of how the Hebrew expression Yam Suf should be translated compared to the usual translation of Red Sea. A Yam means sea, and it is the meaning, it is the meaning of the word Suf that is disputed. A Yam Suf is interpreted by many to mean sea of reeds rather than the body of water that we today the Red Sea. Now, is that a correct interpretation? Well, let's, let's look at how the word Suf is translated in other parts of the Bible. Now, the term Red Sea originally comes from the early Greek geographers who called the body of water we know today as Red Sea. Now, why did they chose that name? Now, one possibility comes from 1 Kings 19.26, which says... Elath on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. 
Now, Dr. Miles Jones, in his book, The Grinding of God, wrote, the word Edom meant red in ancient Semitic. Therefore, the Sea of Eden, or Edom Sea, is clearly a contender for the origin of the name Red Sea. Now, while Sith can possibly be translated as reeds or rushes, it is more commonly translated as red, but it also has another meaning. Now, Sith with Strong's number 5486 is translated six times as consumed or consumed, once as perished, and in Amos 3.15 is translated as end. Now, Sith with Strong's number 5487 is translated as consumed, in Daniel 2.44, it speaks of the kingdom of God consuming the kingdoms of this world. And the other time it is used is in Daniel 4, where it is translated as consumed. Now, when we look at all the uses of this word suf, um, the overwhelming emphasis is on something being consumed or ending, not the botanical meanings used in the four times for Strong's reference 5, 4, double 8. Now we have two very clear references to the term Yam Suf being used to describe the arm of the Red Sea, known as the Gulf of Aqaba. Now in 1 Kings 9.26, Solomon is said to have had his ships built at Izzy on Gibba at the top of the Gulf of Aqaba, and that nearby Elath is on the shore of Yam Suf. In Exodus 23.31, it also speaks of the balance of the Promised Land being from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. Now Israel's southwest border was formed by the Wadi El Arish, ending at El Arish on the Mediterranean Sea. Now most Bible scholars recognise this Wadi and not the Nile as the brook or river of Egypt noted in Numbers 34.5 for Israel's southern border. Now as a result, the Red Sea here in Exodus 23-31 is a clear reference to the Gulf of Aqaba. So Israel's border stretched from El Arish to the Gulf of Aqaba in the time of King Solomon at Israel's peak. Now the Gulf of Aqaba doesn't have reeds, so Suf must mean something other than reeds in those verses. Therefore it is very likely that Red Sea is the correct translation for the sea that was crossed by the Israelites, not some sea of reeds. Now given what we have seen so far about the meaning of Suf, the Gulf of Aqaba was probably called the end Suf because it was the end or border of the Promised Land. Now to, do, to determine the way they went to Mount Sinai, we need to know where God parted the Red Sea. Now various locations have been put forth as to where the Red Sea was crossed. Now as noted, many secular and liberal Bible scholars believe that the crossing took place at one of the border lakes thought to exist at the time of the Exodus along where the Suez Canal is today. Now, some have even suggested coastal lagoons near the Mediterranean Sea, like Lake Sabonis. Now, many conservative Christians believe that the crossing took place near the top of the Gulf of Suez. And crossing sites have also been proposed across the Gulf of Aqaba, near its uh, top, close to Elat, near its midway point, from a large beach called Nawaiba, and at its bottom at the Straits of Tehran. Now there are several Bible verses in narrative, as well as poetry, where there is emphasis on the wars that Israel crossed being very deep. Now this doesn't fit the shallow ancient lakes, which were only a few metres deep along where the Suez Canal is today. Now God was clearly not doing a waterboarding session in shallow waters when he drowned the Egyptians. And if he were, Josephus puts the number of Egyptian soldiers who were killed and a quarter of a million. Now if the crossing took place in such shallow water, there should be plenty of remnants in these lakes of where this great army lost their lives, yet nothing has been discovered at those lakes. Now the wilderness shut the Israelites in at the point where God parted the Red Sea according to the Bible. 
Now Josephus is clear as crystal that it wasn't coastal topography, but mountainous terrain that shut them in. Now these two points appear to clearly rule out those border lanes. Now if we go over to the Gulf of Suez, only one place has mountains to trap the Israelites, and it's narrow enough for them to cross in a single night, and that is the Western Peninsula just south of Suez. Now any further north has got no mountains, and the only places they can access further south are too wide to cross in a single night. Now at that Western Peninsula, the mountains don't go all the way to the sea, and Egyptians could have gone around the southern end of those mountains. So the pillar of fire would have to be at both the top and the bottom to prevent the Egyptians getting to the Israelites. Not to mention the problem of them going around the other side of the Gulf where the Israelites were actually crossing to. So geographically, the top of the Gulf of Suez doesn't match the clues of the crossing site. Now after they crossed the Red Sea, they went through the wilderness of Shur. Now there is a very well-known wilderness of shore just to the east of the Great Bitter Lake, which works for a Water Lakes crossing, or a Gulf of Suez crossing, but not for a crossing over the Gulf of Aqaba. Now this is the strongest point against the Gulf of Aqaba. Now the name Shur means wall or barrier. Now Glenn Fritz, however, makes an interesting case for the mountain range that goes from Eden down to Midian as also being called Shur. Now Shur is mirrored in the Arabic name El Hijaz for this range which means the barrier. Now those who support a border lakes crossing might scoff at this suggestion of a second wilderness of Shur. However, border lakes crossing theorists are essentially proposing the same thing with regards to one of the border lakes being called Em Suf, the Hebrew that's translated as Red Sea. The only body of water that, without question, is called the Suf is the Gulf of Aqaba, as noted in 1 Kings 9, where Solomon built a naval base. For one of the border lakes to be a crossing site would require there to be multiple Yamsufs. Now, when I complete the handout for this series on Moses, I will include this slide which, where I give a yes, no, or maybe for each of the contenders for the location of the Red Sea crossing to 10 biblical clues for the crossing site. I'll just add a few key points here. Now the first clue is that they didn't go via the way of the Philistines, which was the coastal route near the Mediterranean. Now this is a big cross against Lake Bala in the northeast being the crossing site. Lake Bala and Lake Timsa further south are literally between one and three meters deep hardly the deep waters that are noted in the Bible. And number 33 notes that they camped again by the Red Sea after Elam, the first encampment after the Red Sea crossing, which would then again rule out the water lakes. Now the Gulf of Aqaba is the strongest with the critical clue of the wilderness shutting the Israelites in, as we've just seen, as it doesn't work for a Gulf of Suez crossing. Now the last clue is that they passed through Izzy and Geba at the top of the Gulf of Aqaba on their way from Mount Sinai, but not on their way to Mount Sinai. And if Mount Sinai was in Midian, east of the Gulf of Aqaba, they would have to then cross through Izzy and Geba both ways if they crossed on land both times. Now while there are still question marks in relation to a couple of points, there are far less problems with the Gulf of Aqaba compared to the other options. And because of this, I'm much more inclined to believe Glenn Fritz's view that the wilderness of Shur of the Exodus referred to the mountains east of the Gulf of Aqaba and not to the wilderness of Shur that um, is noted in other verses. Now having gone through that analysis of those 10 geographic clues, I believe that the best candidate that matches the biblical record is the Gulf of Aqaba. Now that said, did they cross the Gulf at, in the middle at Nueva or at the bottom at the Straits of Tehran? Now Steve Rudd is one person who proposes a crossing via the Straits of Tehran. 
Now, one thing that impresses me the most about his route uh, down the western Sinai Peninsula and across the Straits of Tehran and then onto Mount Sinai is that the route on both sides is mostly flat and wide and ideal for a multitude to traverse. Now, that said, I'm reminded of Jesus' words about the wide road and the narrow path. Now, in Exodus 14, 2, God told the Israelites to make a turn in order to go to where they would camp by the Red Sea. Now, the road going south along the western side of the peninsula bends where it reaches the southern end of the peninsula, but it's not really a turn because it's the same road. Now, Steve believes that the, the turn is actually a U-turn back where the mountains go all the way to the sea on the eastern side. Now, I have reason to doubt this because it is actually God who is leading them through the pillar of cloud and fire. Now, can you imagine the pillar of fire suddenly going beep, 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 beep as it's reversing? And you can just imagine the complaining is what's saying, oh, great, even God doesn't know where he's going. It would, it would actually make much more sense on God's part to have them camp at the crossing site and arrange for some scouts who would report back that they've reached a dead end. Now the depth of the strait here is 200 metres, which is about a quarter of the depth at Nueva, halfway up the Gulf. Now it's still very deep for any kind of natural phenomenon to have made a crossing possible. And there's also a couple of other problems. There's the problem of a very steep gradient going into it if we strip it of water. And plus there's a lot of um, massive coral beds if you strip it of water. Now midway down the Gulf of Aqaba, there is an enormous beach at, uh, called Nueva. Now the only way to it is Wadi Mutir, which fits Josephus' description of how they were being trapped the Egyptians as they came down the wadi. Now on either side of this proposed crossing site, the gulf is more than two miles deep. However, at this point it is nowhere near as deep as either side of this proposed crossing site. Now over a long period of time, the sediment washes down through the wadi and has created that enormous beach there at Nueva and, and all that sediment has continued on into the Gulf itself, creating that lesser deep place. Now that said, it is still 800 metres deep in the middle of this proposed crossing site. Now 800 metres is about the height of the world's tallest building in Dubai. Now despite that depth in the middle, because it is 15 kilometres across to the other side of the Gulf, the actual gradient is quite manageable. The gradient, the gradient of this proposed site is actually a modest seven uh, degrees for the whole way down and the whole way back up again, which is about similar to a typical wheelchair ramp. And plus the bottom is sandy without sharp coral beds found at the other proposed crossing site. Now as spectacular as a, a miracle as it would take to cross, this is the one location that best fits the clues. The Waymo Beach is five miles or eight kilometres from north to south, and the waters, waters were probably that far apart with plenty of room for all to make the crossing. Now to cross the 10 miles, sorry, 15 kilometres I should say, at uh, 2.5 miles an hour, it would take about six to seven hours for everyone to cross. Now after leaving Ramesses, the later name for Avaris, they camped at Sikoth and then Etham. And then after making a turn off the main road, they camped by the Red Sea. Now the Red Sea was their third camp. Now there would be one more camp at the oasis of Elam after they crossed the Red Sea before we are given our first time marker on the journey. Now just after Elam, they had travelled for, it says, a month. Now in that month, they camped at four places, one camp per week, and which day of the week were they camped and rested on? Well, being Israelites, following God's laws, they naturally would have rested on each weekly Sabbath. 
So by that reckoning, the Red Sea crossing occurred just after their third Sabbath on the road to Mount Sinai. And we are told that God visibly led them in the form of a pillar of cloud by day, which gave them shade, and a pillar of fire, which gave, gave them light by night, allowing them to journey by both day and night. Now after letting the Israelites go, the Pharaoh's heart was harmed again, and he took 600 chariots along with his army to recapture the Israelites. Now likely on his way there, he gets the news about the turn that they've made, which has likely taken him down Wadi Matia to the Red Sea. He would have thought, aha, I've got them completely trapped. Now that Wadi varies between about 50, um, 50 metres and about 200 metres wide, so it's relatively narrow, but, and with a couple of hundred people abreast, the Israelites from above would have looked like a 20 kilometre long snake winding its way down that valley. Of course, the Israelites complain to Moses that he has brought them out of Egypt just to die. Moses then tells them to not be afraid, but to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I can almost hear Charlton Heston as Moses saying, Behold his mighty hand! It says that the pillar of cloud, indicating that it's still day, moved between the Egyptians and the Israelites to protect Israel. Now Moses stretched out his hand and God divided the wars for Israel to walk across the dried up sea floor. Now though it is still daylight when the pillar moves to protect the Israelites from the Egyptian army, the actual crossing takes place at night time, which is noted twice in these verses, just like in the Ten Commandments movie. Now it is likely late Sabbath afternoon when the Egyptians arrive and the crossing itself takes place just after sunset, likely on Saturday night. Now the waters were like a huge wall on their left and their right hands. Now this is truly one of the most stupendous miracles that mankind has ever witnessed. Now this brings us to our fourth lesson that we can learn from Moses and the Exodus. Stand still in your heart, calmly trust him to open up a path out of your problems, and obediently go forward when he does. Now God is the specialist when it comes to those things which seem impossible to us. Now in Exodus 15, 8, Moses says that the depths were congealed. Now the Hebrew word for congealed here means to thicken or make solid like ice. Well, I believe that God did use a wind when he initially parted the waters, but once they were parted, he then used a strong east wind to freeze the giant walls on either side of them. And this was the purpose of the strong east wind, to keep the walls frozen, just like Superman's icy breath. Now this super strong wind was only on, on the two sides, and God would have made sure that it was calm for most of the five miles wide where in between where the Israelites crossed. Now the name Nueva, according to the Ask Aladdin travel website, is Old Arabic for spring waters because of many wells in the general area. Now the full name of Nueva on this particular map shown here is Nueva El Mazayina. Now according to every search result on Google I found, this means the waters of Moses opening though uh, Google Translate is not able to translate from Arabic to English for me. Now there is a question mark over this being a correct translation, but if it is a correct translation, this would give some strong support for this location being the correct crossing site. Now I still can't believe all the amazing computer graphics we have seen in movies these days that no Bible movie over 60 years later has improved upon the Red Sea Crossing in the Ten Commandments movie. I was so disappointed with the movie Exodus, Gods and Kings, which watered down the Red Sea crossing to just having the tide actually go out. Now that said, there is some excellent graphics and animation in the Patterns of Evidence documentary, The Red Sea Miracle. Now here's a great screenshot from that documentary showing the Red Sea crossing. 
Now, as noted before, the Nuweiba beachhead is five miles wide, so there was plenty of width for all the Israelites to cross through. And here's another screenshot showing the towering walls of sea as the Israelites walked through. Now, I like in this shot that the light coloured sections in the wall of water give the impression that the water was frozen or congealed, as uh, Exodus 15 8 indicates. And uh, just for a little bit of fun, here's a dessert that was made by Jason Webster from our Gold Coast Church during a recent Unleavened Bread Festival, uh, fe uh, picturing the Red Sea crossing of Lego figures. And you can see Moses at the front and, and Pharaoh at the back chasing them. And this actually reminds me of a video I saw about the special effects of the Red Sea crossing, uh, how they were done in the original Ten Commandments movie. And when the original Lars Sons on movie version that Cecil B. The Mill made 30 years earlier, they actually used jelly or jello as the Americans call it for the walls of water. Now Josephus wrote the following in Antiquities of the Jews. But when they saw they were going a great way without any harm and that no obstacle or difficulty fell in their journey, they made haste to pursue them, hoping that the sea would uh, be calm for them also. But the Egyptians were not aware that they went into a road made for the Hebrews. As soon, therefore, as ever the whole Egyptian army was within it, the sea flowed to its own place. Showers of rain also came down from the sky, and dreadful thunders and lightning with flashes of fire. Thunderbolts also darted upon them, and thus did all these men perish. So there was not one man left to be a messenger of this calamity to the rest of the Egyptians. As for them. Now, so we see here Josephus backing up the point that I brought out from several verses in part one that uh, no Egyptian was left, not even the Pharaoh. Now, later, when Rahab hid the spies in Jericho, she said that the people had heard about the great miracle of the Red Sea crossing, and that miracle, plus their Transjordan victories, caused the hearts of the people of Jericho to melt out of fear. So, if there were no Egyptians left to tell the story, just how did the nearby nations find out about this great miracle of the Red Sea crossing? And if I had to speculate, I would say they found out from the mixed multitude that accompanied the Israelites and went through the Red Sea with them. The mixed multitude may well have been given a leave to part from the Israelite camp when they reached Mount Sinai, or later at Kadesh when the Israelites were sentenced to a further 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Now, one discovery made on this beach at Namaiba was a memorial pillar without any inscriptions. Now, according to Ron White, when he was in Saudi Arabia, a second pillar was found on the opposite side with the following words in Phoenician letters Mizraim and Egypt, Solomon, Edom, Death, Moses, Pharaoh, and Yahweh. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the claim of Ron White, but unfortunately, we haven't been able to verify this independently. Now, even if there was just one pillar at this location and not one on the opposite side, it does beg the question why it was erected there first place because as we've seen this location is effectively a dead end at the end of a long body. Now diving excursions along this proposed crossing site have unearthed coral encrusted objects that appear in the shape of chariot wheels. Now Leonard Mullat says that the metal of ancient chariots would have corroded away but before it did coral wrapped around these objects, preserving the shape of the long since corroded metallic object. Now the one on the left was found by Ron White on the Nuweiba beach side. The one on the right and bottom were independently found on the other side. Now of the many coral features like this, Leonard Mullen claims that about one, one fifth registered metal when he passed them over a metal detector with them. Now, of special interest is a gilt, very fragile gilded chariot wheel that has the same colour as electric. Now, the photos of these at different angles were taken by Ron White. 
Now, due to shifting sands, they've not been able to be re-photographed by anyone else. So I do hope that one day this can be independently, someone can independently verify this object being there. Now, while <coughs> electrum is commonly used in Egypt, it's unusual to find it gilding a chariot. And might this perhaps be a remnant of the pharaohs of very own chariot? That'd be very cool if it was. Now, there have also been human and horse bones found at the Nueva Beach crossing site, according to Lynn Moller. Now, I've not heard of any uh, discoveries of such bones or evidence or chariots at the Straits of Tehran crossing site, so that does lend more support to the Nueva location. Now, the video and photos of these few objects that appear in the shape of chariots are quite modest archaeological finds and much more is needed to build up an archaeological case for this being the crossing site. Now in part two of the Patents of Evidence um, documentary, The Red Sea Miracle, Tim Mahoney interviews two divers who accompanied Ron White, who told an extraordinary story of seeing a chariot built like this, which had at least five spokes. Now hopefully more deep water excursions with remote underwater drones to the bottom of the middle of the Gulf and near Nueva might one day find up some better finds. As we saw, Josephus says that a quarter of a million Israelite, I'm sorry, Egyptian soldiers lost their lives. So one would expect that there's still to be some remnants left. Now to finish off our look into the Red Sea crossing, there is one ancient artifact that could well be the greatest example in archeology span of something that is hidden in plain sight. Now this artifact, May well, be, may well graphically represent the Red Sea crossing. Now this artifact is one of the Mycenaean uh, funeral stele, or basically it's an ancient tombstone that was found at the site made famous as the city that Agamemnon of the Trojan War came from in Greece. Now this stele is literally the very first thing that you see when you enter the main museum at Athens. Now I was especially interested to take these photos of it when I was there, as Simka Yakovici in his documentary The Exodus Decoded makes the case that the tombstone on the left shows a visual representation of the Red Sea crossing. Now as you can see it's got three panels. The top and bottom have swirling symbols, possibly indicating water. Now in the middle are two characters facing off against each other. Now the museum curators, not making any such connection with the Red Sea crossing, have written the following in their description of the artifact to the side of it. Now they've written this. The upper and lower panels are filled with spirals, while the central panel has a chariot pulled by a galloping horse and driven by a standing charioteer. In front of the horse is a second male figure that appears to be attacking the chariot with a spear held in his raised right hand, end of quote. Now, is this a graphical representation of the Red Sea crossing hidden in plain sight? Well, you can be the judge of that. It should be noted that many scholars believe that the Danai, who migrated to Greece, were descendants of the tribe of Dan. Now, the second stele on the right looks similar, but it's got only two panels. Now, one has spirals, and the bottom panel has some spirals and two men. One of them on the chariot and the other on foot. Now the second panel could well be the waters coming back onto the Egyptians before they were drowned. So on that high note, with the Pharaoh and his army destroyed and the Israelites free to press onto Mount Sinai, we'll finish up with part three. And in part four, we'll cover the journey from the Red Sea to Mount Sinai, and then cover the events of their many months based at Mount Sinai. At this stage, I'm slated to speak up here again on January 14, so I look forward to continuing the story of Moses and the Exodus with you all then.